Hello and welcome to the beautiful Idjafell in Sweden for the second round of the Orienteering World Cup in 2021 and uh, it couldn't be really more different from the last time uh, the, top, the world's top orienteers got together this we've got some fantastic uh, forested terrain here with really good runnability we're going to be having a middle distance and a relay over at the weekend but today it's the turn of the long distance we'll be starting with the women's competition and then uh, moving on to the men's and it's pretty good conditions in the forest for spectating and for running we've had uh, a lot of the starters um the first starters some a lot of finishes through even um already as well and they've already been laying the marks out in the terrain testing out uh all the different route choices uh, so it's a long long start list we've got today we've got uh, nearly a hundred women and over a hundred men taking to the forest with a three minute start interval means it's been a long old afternoon for those who are watching the race all the way from the start but hopefully you've been already paying attention to some of the uh, split times that we've got in the forest we've got some pictures here and you can kind of see not everything is quite as visible as where the spectators are at the bottom of the hill some of it is is quite varied we've got some these very rocky areas up here we've got parts with lower visibility even though it's all marked as white on the map it's there are parts with lower visibility and that should um kind of add some challenges i think as well so we will start as i said with uh, the women's course today 12 and 12.8 kilometers 20 controls our estimated winning time today is about 80 minutes we can look at the split times. I think our current leader, Hannah Lundberg, has done it in 92.23. So that is that is where that's the quickest time at the moment. But we should get down towards um, 80 minutes by the time. Our last starter, Tova Alexanderson, heads into the forest. But it's really great to see we've got some spectators actually out in the forest here today going to cheer on uh, the competitors as they come down here this is right at the bottom of the hill by the lake as you can see here but let's have a look now at uh, the course map Jonas why don't you talk us through it yeah I mean look at this map here it's just be beautiful it's every orienteer's dream to be in the kind of the wilderness as we have it here in Idre we start with a very short control uh, gives the runner a bit of a possibility to look at the route choice to control two then we have uh, three four five first tv control at control five uh, then one of these controls where we have it change in visibility towards control six i expect that one to be quite a decisive one i think we'll come back to that later uh, control 11 again tv control then we have a longer leg towards the arena where we have an arena passage and also a map change Interesting here, after the arena passage, we will go all the way up 200 meters climbing towards control 14 and the so-called Bermuda Triangle. Here it's very difficult, it's very detailed, visibility is low and it's stony in the ground. Then 17, 18 looks rather easy, but also there around control 18 visibility is low, so this one can be surprisingly surprisingly difficult then 19 very open forest again and back to the finish yeah so that's the the overall shape of the course got you know classic long distance mix of, of long legs short legs but let's have like a, a better look then here at uh, some of the route choices you can see with a starting uh, slightly further up the hill you can see it's basically one big slope but lots of detail in there as well so you've got this a uh, short one to number one and then here we've got some different route choices to go to number two mm, you have uh, more or less three different options and my guess is that many runners will choose the blue one it's rather easy there is a small path in the beginning uh, you can avoid unnecessary climbing uh, there's also the possibility to go around course planner said it was surprisingly okay but you still lose a few seconds it's not recommended to run straight there because uh, the ground is very cracky it's stony and it's rather like slow 
and you have to be focused all the time. So I think many of the runners will go around there. Yeah, and they'll go around to the left. They're going around to the right, you've got like 30, 40 meters more climb. You've got a significant amount of distance, even if you can hit the road and get the fast running. And then on the track down the hill again, you can see from the graphic just going how much climb you're, more climb you're going to have to take on that control. Mm, and here we see some kind of change in visibility. Here it's very good and open. And then you see now... Uh, soon we come suddenly into an area where the, the forest is much more dense and visibility gets lower and you have, you have to be prepared for changes like this. It wasn't too extreme here. Uh, we will have controls where it is much more extreme than at this control, for example, control six there. Yeah, and this is because it's it's not a plantation for us. It's not a working for us. It's a, it's a nature reserve. So you've got these mixes in vegetation. You've not got any like solid um, mm vegetation boundary lines you've actually it all kind of changes quite subtly and mm -hmm. and doesn't really change very uniformly as well which is why it's always basically all white and i mean this makes it very difficult for the runner because you usually you have the vegetation vegetation boundaries and you can see where the uh, the visibility is changing but here you don't have that on the map and suddenly uh the visibility changes and you have always to be prepared because you can't really see it uh, just from reading the map. Here we have another route choice um, straight ahead. Actually the terrain here is really beautiful, really fast and the course planner expects the runner to go quite straight there because it's fast, visibility is good and you can avoid the climbing. Um, long leg after arena passage, this can kind of typical for the whole race when you have these micro mm -hmm. route choices. Uh, it's all about avoiding the climbing because the, the small hills, they're very distinct. It's a lot of up and down and you have to kind of avoid this up and down. And now we are in the Bermuda Triangle and here you see it's stony, it's cracky, it's, the visibility is low, you don't see uh, far away and it slows, it really slows you down and uh, remember also that you have those, you had those 200 meters climbing just before 14 control and then you really have to switch in your head, slow down, I mean you will be slowed down automatically but you, also, you have to do that switch in your head as well and uh, change towards proper map reading, be very careful in what you're doing, because if you're uh, off direction here, it will be very, very difficult to relocate. I mean, there are no paths here uh, where you can easily uh, go out and relocate, uh, so you have to be very careful there. Yeah, it's if you just isolate that bit by itself, it doesn't look too bad, but if you combine it, it's nearly the end of the course. You've just run 200 meters uphill. You've got to change the style of orienteering. It's very, very detailed. It's very, very rocky. And you've got the lower visibility. That, for me, makes that one of the, the most mm -hmm. interesting and, and technical, definitely, parts of this course. Um, when you're, you're tired, you're not in debt because you just come up that hill and it's going to be really really knackering so we will run you through the start list um this is done by in order of the world cup standings but some kind of but we can't have the two nations going um next to each other we've got uh we will we will talk a little bit um about the potential of some trains forming i'm sure later but it'll be those ones kind of the last 10 last six that we're really looking at um to see taking the medals here today um who who, do, who are our favorites Jonas? i mean uh, we have one big indication for a long distance so far and that was the world <laughs> championship so i guess it's fair to say that we have one big favorite to be alexanderson but she had some problems she had actually the coronavirus just after the world championships so she had only uh, one and a half weeks of proper training uh, before this World Cup round here. So it will be interesting to see how she can perform today. But then we also have Simona Abersolt, Natalia Gempele, Lisa Risby, Andrine Benjamins. I mean, there are many names we could highlight here and they are coming towards, towards uh, the end, of course. Yes, so Tove Alexanderson, the big favorite. And if anybody can have a suboptimal preparation for this, um, <laughs> for this World Cup and still win, it's her. You know, we saw her actually not really have very clean races in, um, like, previously. 
in the results uh, in, in the World Championships and actually do really, really well. This is our leader, though. This is Hannah Lundberg. And actually, it makes me quite happy to say that she's still leading because she's the one I put a big star next to on my notes on the start list because um, she is still uh, a junior, the Swede, but she had some really, really great results, seventh and eighth um, in the sprint races at the European Championships. Unfortunately, a disqualification, I think missing out of control uh, in the sprint qualification for the World Championships. Uh, so we've only, we've really only really seen her on the uh, world stage uh, as a sprinter, but we know she's such a great talent for someone so young and of course on the home terrain as well. I think it's no surprise we see her currently uh, at the top of the standings. How much of a home advantage is there here, uh, especially as, um, you know, th this is not the, the major event of the season and, and they will not have done, you know, quite the same preparations as they will have done for the races in the Czech Republic for the world champs. Mm. Um, for sure it is an advantage also because many of the Swedish runners have been running in Idre before. Uh, there is a competition every year here. It's nice to do some holidays uh, at that place. So many of the runners have been there and been competing before. But not only the Swedish team has been there before. I think many of the runners know kind of this terrain and I mean, it's not that you have to learn the route choices because it's more or less uh, about going straight. And then the difficult part is the micro orienteering or the, the fine orienteering. And this is kind of a thing that many of the runners, um, yeah, they, they, they're able to do that on a high level. Uh, no, uh, yeah, no matter where they are. So I think, yeah, it is an advantage. It's always an advantage to be on home soil, but I, well, I mean, it, this won't well, be lots, the reason it's why... It's not quite as special... Yeah, it's not quite as specialised as the Czech Republic. They will... A lot of runners exactly. will have experience of running on similar terrain to this. It's and not, you've not got those really special route choices, as you said. Ex exactly. I mean, in a terrain, as we had it at the World Champs, you have to train uh, the route choice decisions because you have to get a feeling for how fast it is uh, in the green areas uh, how fast is it in the uphills in the downhills in the stony areas and then you have to kind of adapt your route choice decision to that and here it's more or less there aren't many route choices uh, i mean it's micro route choices uh, should you go a bit more around avoid this uh, heavy climbing or this small always up and down um, but in the end, it's not about the route choices, it's about executing uh, the legs as you have it on the maps. And here we have Ingeborg Eide. She missed, I guess, control 9. Yeah, we're live with her close. now and it's a three minute tail. So, it, yeah, my feeling is she's missed this one and had to go mm. back down to these ditches and try and relocate. And it's actually one of the areas where the course planner has been uh, talking about because here you come, you leave control eight and you go in a downhill and in the beginning of the downhill visibility is very good. Uh, the terrain is very fast and then halfway to the control, the visibility changes. You have, uh, first you have this uh, pine trees and then you change to spruce trees and they're smaller and the visibility gets lower and you have to adapt to that otherwise you can do quite some misses here. Um, it's actually hard to say if she, I mean now she's at control 10. Now she's, and I think she's now going back, back towards yeah. control 9 so that that's my feeling on that one. And well, this one you're going, you know, you're going downhill You've got to, there's loads of skills you've got to use mm. for this control in terms of like you're, you're downhill, you're, you're going at an angle, you've really got to get your direction spot on. And you can see uh, Ingeborg Ada was just, you know, like less than 50 meters off. She was really, really close there and just kind of missing things because for the majority of that leg, there aren't really that many features to go, you know, to go. Uh, kind of used to check that you mm. are on your right direction. It's only really when you get to the control itself. Exactly. I mean, already in the easy part where you have good visibility in the beginning, um, you don't have it. The terrain isn't too detailed. So you're, I mean, you're, you know that you're on track on direction, but you're not 100% sure if you're 10 meters to the left and to the right. And then the visibility changes and you never get the chance to really 
uh, relocate or really have a clear attack point just before the control and that makes it really difficult when you head into this more dense area in a downhill uh, that makes it yeah it's kind of extra difficult so this is Nicolina Freeberg Klusner, her sister Cecilia has kind of just started um, on the course. Uh, she's the best of the Danes here today. But this is we're, we're back on the top of, towards the top of this hill now. We've got this rocky section. This is the Bermuda Triangle that you're talking about, so cool because people get lost in here a lot. They do not come out again. We lose them, uh, and that just kind of shows very tricky. And you really have to kind of, yeah, slow the pace down and be very, very accurate. As you can see, Klusen are coming through there 20 minutes down at the moment. Mm -hmm. Here we see the way she's approaching the control. I mean, here the long leg, it's not too difficult um, direction. It's mostly about uh, the climbing that makes it yeah, tough here. And then you get close to the control and here you have to be really sure where you are because uh, suddenly the, the visibility gets lower and you have to change the kind of orienteering uh, when you approach the control and uh, it's kind of interesting because the course planner said that everyone will feel very slow there between control 14 and 17 it's something to you have to get over kind of and then you compare it to passages like here uh, where you really can push hard and uh, just enjoy the running and it's easy I mean in passages like this one here it's very easy to get into the flow kind of yeah Vera Clementon and then here a good uh, finish sprinter is just on her way down here towards control number 11 and what a contrast here between these uh, the type of areas and you can just really look ahead spot the control from a long way and then we'll get some water you can see there as well i think she's caught up number 66 ingeborg ada yep caught that caught her up so it's good feedback mm. there oh and actually we can see it wasn't clean for hannah Lundberg. no but that was kind of the thing we were talking about before you have this very open area there down in, and if you mm. don't have direction you don't really notice because there's nothing you can correct your direction on you just have this slope and it looks kind of the same to the left and to the right and you have to trust that you're on the r on the right way but if you're not if you just i mean there're just a few degrees she was off direction mm. but yeah if you run 1k a few degrees wrong then it's uh, in the end it's quite many meters and you you didn't you don't really get the chance to adapt the direction on the way to control 9 you have to do it just before the control because then you get some changes in uh, in the contours there. So is the Abbasse there out of the start? She uh, was bronze medalist from the from 2018 middle distance. She had a pretty good uh, world championships with 18th place in the long distance. But we mm. can replay. So yeah, far from clean from Hannah Lindbergh. And again, trying to get a good attack point actually into control number 14 is really difficult because there's lots of very small detail, but not very much that kind of seems to stand out in the terrain. And you can see a lot of both of those women seem to have a good direction for most of the control, but then you get kind of nervous into the control. You, you've, you're getting tired and you're not being as um, disciplined in terms of like checking your compass and checking your direction, second guessing yourself maybe. And then, yeah, as you can see, both making mistakes in either directions uh, to get into control number 14. It's really, really tricky. Mm, I, I can imagine that quite many of the runners get kind of nervous when you you have been running direction for quite a long time with a lot of climbing and you're just uh, kind of hoping for an attack point before mm -hmm. the control for a, a clear feature you can spot or like a, a, a counter that you really can spot and say okay now I'm definitely here but if you don't get this then it will be I mean then you get <laughs> nervous and you're just okay now I just have to trust my direction and then you it doesn't make it easier when you see that okay now the visibility gets lower as well 
Yeah, well, I was just about to talk about the visibility because once you get over the track, that's when the visibility really drops. And that's kind of where we saw those two runners diverge from the red line. And actually, it's so much easier to keep your direction when everything is, um, is open and you can look really far ahead. So let's have a look again at some early... Once again, Hannah Lundberg is our leader at the finish, which is why we're, we're looking quite a lot at her times. So we're going to try and uh, compare uh, her to some of the others later. And Jana Obe is over three minutes slower than, than the Lundberg uh, at control number three. So it seems like Hannah Lundberg has had some, got some good speed and maybe have we seen her route yet to control number two? Because it looks like, you know, already having gained at least three minutes by control Three is very impressive, so uh, maybe we will see um, that very, very soon. But she has made some mistakes, so some good speed, but we know Hannah Lundberg, our current leader, has made mistakes towards the end. So it just shows there's, it's in the fastest time for now, but there's lots more potential for, for those real last starters to uh, improve on that and to go quicker. Mm, and I mean, look at this terrain. It makes, I guess, every orienteer's heart beat a bit faster here. It's just beautiful. I know. I'm so. I just really, really want to be there now, running in this terrain because it's just gorgeous. And when you've got a map that's pretty much got three colours on it, plus <laughs> the white, it's got blue, it's got brown, and it's got a bit of black on it as well, and it's just beautiful. The very opposite of some, you know, if I think back to Estonia and Latvia when you have long, you know, the world champs there when you have long distances that are full of green and grotty and feel just not, you've really got to be in the right zone to just kind of attack that course in order to get any, any speed. You can't hold back. Whereas this one surely has got to feel much, much more satisfying to run through. Mm. Um, but I'm very happy that we have these changes in the terrain anyway, because <laughs> if we only would have this kind of terrain, it's, yes. uh, everyone would get so used to it. And it's, I mean, the, the really interesting thing about orienteering is that you have to adapt to different kind of terrains and you have to make different decisions uh, depending on like visibility and runnability and kind of the vegetation and everything. But of course, for the runners, this one is just, uh, I mean, you have these parts when you really get the flow and it's just about running fast, as you see it here in the pictures. And then um, you get into the areas where it gets a bit more bushy, but still it's not the kind of bushy that holds you back. It's just the one that makes the orienteering part um, more difficult and maybe also it slows you down a bit, but it's not the unpleasant kind of uh, green areas and that makes it very enjoyable for the runners yep so we've seen amy newman go through there at control number 11 and we can see her her roots compared to the current leader on her way into particularly to control nine we see a lot of people kind of drifting right of the mm -hmm. red line like west of the red line in order to get in there maybe looking at the marsh to try and um correct and try and get back towards the control the marsh is going to be quite visible in this terrain yeah and they are actually quite fast as well um we heard some voices from pre-runners and they said that sometimes it's almost that you want, like you're looking out for the marshes to run in them because it's kind of flat and it's it's fast. It's it's not very wet in the forest and usually, I mean, sometimes around you have it a bit stony and everything, but in the marshes it's it's good runnability here, so it's not a bad thing to run in them. So just saw Anastasia Rydnaya start, and we're looking now. At, so we're going to be looking for Yana Shikova. The Czech athletes, as compared to Sulunberg, and there's a mistake from Hannah Lundberg. She goes mm -hmm. almost towards control number 15, and Yana Shikova just. Yeah, that's now she's in this Bermuda, Bermuda triangle, and that's <laughs> yeah. exactly what we were talking about before. 
if you lose contact to the map here it's i mean you can you get everything you you get everything fitting to the map if you want it like in your head it's just uh, everything looks the same and it's hard you don't have this special feature where you can say okay this is this i have to be here because look look at this mess there <laughs> you can be uh, everywhere um so yeah i'm not sure she's quite found number 14 yet which is why she was looking over no. towards the left um mm -hmm. Uh, and now, and also, you see the cameras there, you know there's some controls around, but you can't see them. The it thing is also that up. you have the cameras all the way from 14 to 15, and usually you try to, okay, I see the camera, I have to be close to the control, which is right here, but um, because we have the controls at uh, like three different positions, you can't be sure that you're close to the control. And for me, this looks actually as if she she doesn't really have a concept what to do once she's off direction and this kind of has to relocate she's standing a lot she's looking at the map and around but it doesn't really seem i mean it it doesn't look like a concept she's kind of hoping for the best and now she's following the camera positions and gets to the control 15 here so at yes, least she knows she, where she is now. Yeah, and then at least she knows it's the wrong control as well. Um, you know, she doesn't go and punch it and then keep going onwards, which is a thing that, in the heart of a race, you know you're going wrong. You just kind of do that. So mm. tough. So it's also interesting to see that she did kind of the same thing as Hannah Lundberg. She, it seems as if she had control when she crossed the path but after that she was running too far to the right and getting off direction and I wonder if it's kind of I mean there can be many reasons for that but um, maybe there's animal tracks in one direction it's more convenient to run there maybe it's less stony on the ground uh, but usually when you get I mean you see on the map that this control will be very difficult and you have this path a few hundred meters before the control then you have to be 100% sure that you leave the path at the position where you exactly know where you are and that you are 100% sure about your direction. Yeah, uh, it's all sorts of reasons why you can be pushed to go right around every single tree and then suddenly you realize you've gone completely off your line. Uh, and having to make adjustments like this. Well, Theresiana Shikova has already been to Control 16, so she knows where it is, but Emma Biesmo has uh, caught up uh, a significant amount of time on uh, Yana Shikova, about uh, 14 minutes, something like that, but she's not going to be um, quicker than her teammate Hannah Lundberg at this point. But mm -hmm. it looks like she will sit into comfortably into the second fastest time at this point. Mm. And you know, uh, it's a pr mostly downhill from here. <laughs> yeah, and she was four. She was five minutes behind at the arena passage. Um, now it's around three, a bit less. So we know that we can see that. I mean, we have seen that Hannah Lund, but he did a mistake there. So we can say it's most probably was ab around two minutes. She lost here towards control. Yeah, fourteen and fifteen. Mm -hmm. So we have already, you know, with only we're maybe about two thirds of the way through our starters, and we've already seen some uh, good mistakes here amongst the top athletes. A replay then here of what you were just talking about, Jonas, which is that gap of and kind of four or five minutes at the arena passage. Look at Hannah Lundberg there. She got to the stone, noticed, okay, I'm off direction, and then she went more uh, towards the red line. Um, corrected the direction very good there but then she got into the same kind of problem again going too much to the to the right to the east here and then missing the control and if you compare that to uh bs she had just a good, very good direction before you can also see that she slowed down just before the control she wanted to read every single detail there and i think this was a really good uh example for how you should do the orienteering towards control 14 there yeah, she really paid off. We haven't really seen many people going left of the line at control, to go up to control 14 and avoid. You see, you've got lots of little hills on there. You want to try and one mm. of the options that the call setters were saying was to, to go further left where you, you're not going kind of up and down the whole time. So we haven't really seen many people do that. 
um, currently. But let's uh, take a look at Andrina Benjaminson on the start line. Fourth place, equal fourth place at the long distance of the World Championships. A really strong forest orienteer and um, one of one of the favourites to take a medal here today. Yeah, I mean, she was uh, very good in every start she had. Uh, seems that she is on a very high level at every competition she's running at the moment. So for sure, we have to have her up there um, among the favourites for the top three positions today as well. Yeah, some great consistency from uh, the Norwegian. And we'll see who might be able to follow her. Round. No, we're going to have a look at the finish then and uh, Svensson here, I think making her World Cup debut for Sweden is in towards the finish. Number 47, just really springing down that long leg there to, ooh, that's a crash down on the hill, but she will go into kind of sixth, fifth, sixth position. Swedish colours for Andrea Svensson right there. Andrea Svensson then into sixth position. And there's, there's, a, there's a screen right there to tell you where you finished. But uh, not a bad, I think, debut there for Andrea Svensson. So Hannah Lundberg still the current leader then. Victoria Hester Bjornstad from Norway is in yeah. second place. Ida Hapala okay. in third place. Okay, now we are towards control 14, so this is, we don't have the red line there. See her approaching this control very good. Also 50, no problems. That's very well done here in the Bermuda Triangle. Now control 18, as the course planner said, also low visibility there. Crossing the path, getting into the stony area, no problems towards control 18. So. Um, this passage here actually looked very, very good uh, by Andrea Svensson. She must have made a mistake somewhere in the beginning because um, she's a, I mean, she's uh, way off the pace of Hannah Lundberg and she has the potential to be much higher up um, in the ranking list. Yeah, for me it was very safe orienteering to control the great team. Yeah, but um, that's exactly what you should do there, because if you are in an area with lower visibility, you better play it safe, otherwise you can lose a lot of time. I mean, we have seen Hannah Lundberg, she did quite many mistakes anyway, and she, is, uh, she has a big lead of seven minutes. Um, I mean, we are not talking about this big five minutes mistake but she was she lost two minutes to control 14 she was off direction uh, also just before the arena passage in the downhill there um, and if you play it safe always when you get into these areas where it gets more dense and more difficult I think that's a good tactic maybe um, Svensson did like miss to do that in the beginning and lost a lot of time and then kind of changed it to her style of orienteering in the end of the race yeah change tactic keep it um keep it safe especially when you're getting to the end of the race i think as well that's really really key here's sarah hagstrom though and looks good and attacking out of the start there's a little run out to the start it's a very short number one and then we've got that long um, control to number two with a, about a, just over 100 metres of climb on that control to number two. Mm, a bit of a debriefing there. One thing we didn't really mention so far is uh, we have seen this control or the root choice towards control 14 many times and usually you have a lot of time to prepare a control like this but in this case here you have it like directly after the arena passage and you have a map change there so you you don't you have no idea where to go after the arena passage until you get the map and you can prepare it and then you see it okay it's it's a long leg, it's a lot of climbing, and then you have also, uh, you also have to switch 
uh, the kind of orienteering, your orienteering style, your uh, tactics in the very end of the control, and you, uh, yeah, I mean, you have no time to prepare for that, and I think that's an Im interesting uh, move of the of the course planner there. Yeah, I think it's that that is that is a really good example of the course planning, course setters making it making it difficult making it really hard you know they could have given them a nice short control there but no we're gonna put you all the way back up to the top of the hill 200 meters of climb and then give you some short controls in the most technical bit of the area this is mean how the, this is the course planning level that you have on mean, a, you know the top level we have a very experienced course planner here he has actually won the last world cup race here in idre back in 2002 uh, when the, where we had the uh, ultra long distance Matthias Carlson, um, very experienced course planner, of course. So he knows how to make it how to make it tricky in this type of terrain and how to run well on this type of terrain yeah, as yeah, well. So. Exactly. So we haven't seen many splits yet from uh, TV number one, but. Uh, Lotta Kahola is on her way to the fifth control. A few very short ones here, and she goes into third place currently. Mm, interesting, as you mentioned before, it's a big gap here already at the fifth control. Uh, Hannah Lundberg really must have uh, pushed hard there in the beginning. You see also that she's really glued to the red line there. Both Biesmo and Lundberg try to stay as close to the line there as possible. Yeah, that's really impressive direction work there. But yeah, you mm. look at this but gap here, already, as you were saying. Control but here number six. it's actually a bit easier because you you see where the G of her name is at the moment. You have uh, one stone and then you have a second stone coming. So you have actually... Uh, yeah, two or three features to that help your orienteering. Also, the visibility in the beginning there is quite good. And then when you get towards now here at this uh, in this area here, it changes always when you have these water features around. That's something mm -hmm. the course planner told us. Uh, often when you have uh, water features around as marshes or uh, kind of small ponds, visibility gets a bit lower. Maybe not the marshes, but if you have these uh, rivulets and uh, ponds and everything, then it's uh, oft often a bit more dense. Yeah, and harder to keep that direction. I think you can, when you can see a long way in the distance, it's you can spot something really, really far away. You can check mm. to either side and see are you online compared to where you think you should be. You can, you know, maybe look at the little where there's the index contour, the little re-entrant in there, and spot that and head in that direction. And especially when you're going downhill as well, you can just see the whole forest kind of open up in front of you and much it's easy to have a, a higher speed and, and good direction when you've just got that confidence over okay I can see that that you know a few hundred meters away and um, and, and run in that direction really helpful so we're back up in this Bermuda Triangle Lenka Meklova one of the uh, Czech athletes didn't actually make the team for the World Championships, but on her way around this course now. Of course, we've got bigger, much bigger teams. We've got big start lists um, for the World Cup compared to the World Championships. So we may well see the the top kind of 20 positions being packed by those teams who've got the depth like Sweden, like Switzerland, like Norway. We're just being pretty careful through here, through these rocks. But no problems immediately there. Thank you. 
Okay, we are into the top four starters. This is done, of course, by uh, the world rankings and adjusted so you don't get two nations starting next to each other. We have got a three minute starter interval at that point. That was Carolyn Olsen. And uh, we will, I'm sure, we'll talk about her later on. But back with uh, Svetlana Miranova, the very experienced Russian who has got a few uh, medals to her name from back in the day. Mm -hmm. A gold medal in long distance, 2014. For example. Yeah, so she really knows how to, uh, well, perform well at this long distance, but that experience that comes from just spending more time and time in the forest, um, you know, things will, you, you, you know what, what to expect, what things are going to look like. You're not worried about, um, it's, you know, everything's just kind of less surprising. And then that just takes, makes it easier to do the orienteering. It's less mental energy spent on... Uh, on kind of identifying the features and being able to pick your route choices, things like that. But you can see it's split one to four minutes down. 15th place currently. Mm, Let's have a we little replay of some of the top runners. We saw that uh, Hanna Lundberg was the only one coming from below there, attacking control two from the south and not from the east. And that's kind of the reason why she has mm. such a big difference here. Yes, I want to see a replay of one to two again. Mm. Uh, so we can have another look at it because that is a big lead by number two. And, yeah. and I think surprising because we know. thought a lot would go the way that she went. Mm. Yeah, it's kind of uh, a thing to avoid uh, telling why things happen because we will have the men's race later on and um, <laughs> they will have the same route choice there so i think it's kind of a safety thing here to not show too much in the beginning of this route choice we'll keep the tension high we will keep the tension high and we'll solve that mystery eventually it's been a house we kind of solved is... it already <laughs> well okay yes <laughs> Housefit though is here um, at the start. I think maybe she didn't quite perform as well as I expected at the World Championships. Um, I think maybe a little bit of kind of subpar performance for the Swiss, but we have very high expectations from her with being very kind of consistent over lots of different disciplines, especially in the forest um, at the uh, World Championships, World Cup races as well. But uh, now here's a group all kind of stuck together. Uh, we've got Lena Sederberry, we've got uh, Yulia Novikova, got Ingrid Lundinez, all looking for this control number 14. It's interesting to look at the group dynamics here because in a mm -hmm. situation like uh, this, you're three runners, uh, no one is 100% sure. Maybe you get a feeling uh, about the direction you should ha head to, but then uh, you don't want to lose the other runners out of sight because in case that someone sees the control you, you wouldn't mm -hmm. want to miss it and uh, it's kind of interesting to see what happens here you see that they stay within eye contact to each other they also saw another runner coming from the control towards the next one but I think that was uh, someone on the men's course and they don't know whether they've got the, the same controls or not at that particular point, mm, now, so yeah, you saw another Novikova following he over heading into one direction, and then you see that if someone here is going towards one direction with like kind of uh, doing it with with kind of uh, yeah a bit a bit faster than just jogging, then the others will follow because they think that maybe she she's seen the control or maybe she has figured out where to go now, uh, but it doesn't really seem right here don't know if they have control 14 already i guess not i don't think so no be interesting to see now she, now she noticed that she is uh, oh. does she oh, notice? okay yeah be careful now oh now she has noticed it Back, maybe the others they already realized what that control yeah. was. Yeah, 
I'm sure so many um, orienteers watching will be able to identify with what these three runners are going through at the moment. When you've got a group and you're kind of just I mean, peering around where everybody else is going or looking around and trying to look at your own map and you're all going running around like headless chickens, not knowing where the control is. It's, it would be even worse in the relay when you're not sure about the forkings and everything. Mm. Here you know that, okay, yeah, if you stay in the group, the others have, they have the same control as I have. Uh, but still it's inconvenient because you don't want to lose the others, especially when you feel that you don't have control over the situation. And you're just hoping uh, that one of the other girls in that case here, or women, will uh, figure it out how to... Uh, yeah, solve the, the problem here. <laughs> yeah, tough, tough orienteering. And it just shows you that, you know, your average orienteer going around in the forest, that these these top elite orienteers, like, kind of get into the same scrapes, the same problems as well, I think. Um, I think that's sometimes quite reassuring that, even the top runners will, will do orienteering fails like I do. Anyway, Emma Biesmo is here on to the finish. And you can see from controls 15 to 19, she has lost a couple of minutes. So it must be a mistake in there. I think we haven't seen from Emma Biesmo, but she will be comfortably into second place here at the finish. She's kind of trying to stay upright on this descent into the line. And she goes there into second place, but still a five minute lead for Hannah Lindbergh, who is just, just been chilling out on the, the leader's chair. Uh, but Emma Biesmo, big smiles for her. Looks like she enjoyed that orienteering and rewarded with a second fastest time currently. But we will see where she's lost time because she's about two, two minutes 46 down at at control kind of 14 15 sorry where we got the split and then by the time number 19 she was like four nearly five minutes down and five minutes down by the time she got to the finish so we will try and see mm, she said she's tired it was, yeah it, it was nice but now i'm tired <laughs> see even i can I'm, now my <laughs> swedish is enough so i can at least translate some of that Denise Kostova, though, here, we're looking at her on the way towards the fifth control. Part of, I think, the Czech women's team who really stepped up uh, for the World Championships. She was 15th in the long distance at those World Championships and 8th in the middle. And part of that relay team taking... Uh, fifth spot there I know they were aiming for some medals it was a tough day in the darkening forest for that world champs relay but she's made a pretty decent start here still nobody getting as cl as close uh, as um, to Hannah Lundberg at this point but there's quite a there's a small group there between two and three minutes behind very yeah, close at that point it's really surprising that the gap is so big in the beginning and uh, i mean we don't really know that but it seems that no one else has taken the same route as uh, hannah lundberg to the second control and that's i mean that's for me that's i i can't understand that because it looks really fast on the map as well it's kind of a risk to go straight there in the very beginning of the race but yeah, hopefully we'll see that later on the GPS. Yeah, and of course when you get to those better runners at the end, we'll maybe hope to see more of them taking what we think is the correct uh, route choice at this point. But Kishinomi here is into the finish and will be over 10 minutes. There. So 11.39 behind, fifth place currently. Yeah, that's good. And yeah, big, big gaps. You see those top six still being split by over 12 minutes there currently. A five minute lead still for Hannah Lindbergh. We know it wasn't a perfect race for her. We've seen a few little small, small mistakes, nothing massive, but we know she's actually had a really, really good start to the race. So we'll be able to compare that as we get the faster and faster runners uh, 
starting. I think pretty much everybody now will be out in the in the field. In fact, a couple of minutes we'll have uh, Natalia Gempler and Tova Alexanderson to start, and then that will be all of the women uh, out in the terrain. One of those uh, few final starters, Lena Strand here from Sweden and she actually only as alongside Karen and Olsen only raced in the sprint races at the world championships and she didn't really perform that well in the test races no she had quite I mean she uh, she didn't have very good test races and it was surprising because when we think back she took a silver medal in Norway mm -hmm. uh, in 2019 it was and uh, it was surprising to see that she couldn't perform on that level now but uh, I mean, uh, hopefully she's back now and can run on a good level today. Yeah, but it's great. Or, I've done a lot of small things, but I've been able to get out of my mistakes and get out of time and get out of time. So I'm very happy with that, but it's just a fantastic environment. And it's just the kind of things that make you hold on to orientation. It's fantastic. It's both fun and technical. You have to look at the feet, you have to look at the cart. There's a lot that happens at once. Eh, och samtidigt få alla de här vyerna som också det är ett större moment och gjort dem och du vet, det är så mycket annat ja, det är bara njutning. Vad det som du hade förväntat dig? Eh, jag hade förväntat mig att jag skulle starta rakt in i det här tekniska som vi hade efter varvning. Eh, så att jag var väldigt inställd på att eh, krypa mig in i kartan men eh, då fick jag ställa om ganska fort eh, för att det var mycket utför mycket löpning och så i början. Eh, men annars... Eh, Ja, rent ut terrängen är här och vad som krävs tekniskt om eh, det, det var som förväntat tycker jag. Tack så mycket. Tack. So, uh, she said that it was very, very nice to run. She was into that what we were talking about before, that this is kind mm. of a, every orienteer's dream. It's <laughs> beautiful in the forest, but still you have to be careful uh, both while running because it's, it's kind of cracky and stony, but also uh, it's technical demanding in some parts and then you have to, all these views and uh, beautiful scenery around um, then but she said it wasn't really as expected because she thought that the course will start into this Bermuda Triangle so, so mm -hmm. she so she had to kind of change uh, her tactics a bit and uh, this was kind of a surprising point but otherwise it I mean the terrain uh, she said wasn't really unexpected uh, because I mean, uh, yeah, if he, he, she definitely has been here before, I guess. Yes, I guess if you go straight, you're kind of going into that Bermuda Triangle, but you, you you've got those route choices to go around it, and then you're you, the the trickiness of this course is that you head into that really technical area towards the end, and after you've done that big climb, you're not kind of yeah, they, they give you time to get tired before you kind of go into that really, really technical area. And I think that's why it's really tricky. Simone Abersold then here, uh, our third from last starter. She is uh, pretty much ready to take the start. And she, of course, uh, the bronze medalist from the world champs, long and very, very consistent at the high end, still a young athlete and really performing very consistently at the top end. Will she be able to challenge Tova Alexanderson? Will Natalia Gembler here, the Russian, be able to challenge Alexanderson as well? She, of course, a second place at the World Champs uh, long distance too. And the way she's been able to regain her fitness after after pregnancy is very impressive. She's worked really hard and she is um, going to really be challenging and pushing in today's race. She's also silver uh, in the sprint distance as well at those world championships. But here, of course, we have the favourite, the big favourite for the race. She won absolutely everything at the world championships and we will put Tova to another test and I'm sure we will see another uh, display of orienteering excellence but as Jonas you said you know she had coronavirus um, straight after the world championships of course had to isolate for a while was was not training or not training kind of uh, the uh, as ideally as she would like and then that um, has only kind of been training for a, in that ideal for about a week and a half so it's not been the best preparations for Alexanderson but 
we just we saw her her raw speed from the world championships she didn't have i don't think she really had clean runs on on any of her races but and especially not the sprint distance where we thought her mistake was going to be so big that she would would not take that title her first sprint title but she's just got that speed that she seemed pretty invincible so we will wait and see whether that's going to be the case um, this is Andrina Benjaminson though through here. Now, is that her having caught up Lisa Risby? Yes, exactly. So now they are together. So it was. Uh, it seems to be a good start. Waiting for the time here for Benjaminson. So she's the first one getting closer to Hanna Lundberg. And uh, we also know that Lundberg did some mistakes later on in the course. So let's see where they come into the picture, which direction they come into the picture from here towards Control 2. That might give us an indication. Uh, no, no, we, don't <laughs> we, won't, we won't see that. But both of them uh, equal fourth place in the long distance, the World Championships. Um, that's a pretty. They, those two working together could do some really good uh, orienteering. This is Cat Taylor. And a big group, actually, as well. We've got Amy Newmarm is number 71 there, so she's caught up. Annika Rima there is number 56. She's been caught a lot, must have had a tricky day in the forest. So the two best in that group are Amy Newmarm and Kat Taylor. And they will, again, all, all use each other. But, but no, no real issues there into... Um, control 15 and kind of splitting up a little bit here uh, as they go further down the slope to number 16. So I wonder if this is going down the hill towards the 11th control. I think it is. There we go. Lotta Kohola we're following here. Really diffuse orienteering. Can just use that a lot of time. Get reading your map. Maybe checking your uh, route choice towards control number 12. You can't plan too far ahead here because, as we said, they've got a map exchange when they go through uh, the arena passage. But very nicely taken uh, that control there. A mm, gel wasn't taken on board, I think. Wasn't too prepared for that. Uh, you could open the the gel uh, a bit earlier already when you spot the control, but maybe she didn't see it early enough. But a good third place there, ahead of Emma Biesmo, who is our current second fastest at the finish. Just skipping across all these bilberries on this floor, and this is this is where you can kind of go pretty straight to control number twelve. The runnability is good. It's all kind of what you can see there. Everly Kasuku here, the Estonian, and she's on her way to control number fifteen. I think it looks like she probably has successfully got number fourteen. You can see just these kind of younger trees getting in the way a little bit. She's coming quite close to the camera, which we haven't really seen. Okay, that's, that's control 14. So you can see she's already, she will be by the time she gets to 15. We'll take the time at control 15 and mm. But she really is looking really carefully here. You can see she's got a magnifier there to check out this really fine detail. I think that's what she was wanting to just take a look at, but stopping quite a few seconds there at that control. I mean, it's kind of surprising, uh, even though you have to be very careful in this leg, uh, it's not about the root choice. So, uh, I mean, yeah, for sure she tried to spot an attack point or kind of a safe way to get to the control because every 
it's it's easy to see that it's difficult here, but in the end you have to take direction and uh, kind of run towards the next control and uh it, it's not you you can start doing that and read the map on the way but she was kind of i, I think she had a lot of respect for this control or for the tasks <laughs> coming yeah and a she, lot of and respect she still has. Slash a lot of fear yeah and but i think I, I that's wonder, where I, yeah i wonder if she i mean we the control before yeah yeah here we are waiting for her She was very close here to the control. Yeah, and for me that just suggests the fact that she stopped there, she wasn't really confident about the the entirety yeah. of the leg. She just wanted to to stop and figure it out and maybe wasn't comfortable so. in terms of planning it beforehand. Anyway, let's have a look at this route choice to number two because no, we've so been wanting to see this for a while. <laughs> so we we know there are three different possibilities. One is to the very east up on the asphalt street there going to the west as Hanna Lundberg or straight on and uh, I mean the, the route Lundberg is taking there is really easy to execute all the way until you have to head up to the into the slope uh, and you see that there is a I mean those this is exactly the gap she has all the way to control five she's just making on this uh, first route choice and we have seen that it's only Benjamin's and even close uh, to Lundberg there. So it was a very good start for her and it proves that you have to go um, to this western most route choice there to control two. Small so, error from Benjamin's uh, yeah. into six, yeah. We were talking about that. It's more dense there, visibility is a bit lower. Um, you have to be sure about the direction. I think if you have the direction, you're, you shouldn't get too much off. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, you, you can see, you should make it there because you have, uh, I think the more dense part starts with this rivulet and then uh, you get that as an indicator for the distance and then you just have to continue and she changed direction very suddenly and that's... That's something she had to get the feeling that she is far too way to the left to do that. Otherwise, I can't really explain it. Yeah, but I thought it was interesting how um, Benny Minson was going straight for the most of the way to number two, and then she kind of bailed out and actually climbed up to the path, um, and then to to take that. I think that's. The course setters are saying, you know, that it's tricky to run through that section. It's mm. also tricky navigation. It's tricky to stay online. So actually, but she's going. It's not worth it. I'm going to bail to the path yeah. and, then, and then approach. I think it it's and, also, and especially the start of the control, start start of the course as well. It's also because you really want to have this small path uh, as your help to take the control, like the to attack the control from and if you if you are too much to the left there you can there is a risk that you miss it but at the same time you would get into the slope very hardly you would notice that but i think she wanted to save it um save up the situation a bit and go to the right so that she can't miss this small path and that's why she did that she for sure lost 20 30 seconds there and here we see that here it's very open, so uh, it's a good option to go straight. Don't have to go down to the street. Lundberg, um, you, re you can see that she has a lot of confidence. She was not hesitating, running just straight there. Um, the thing is also in another race where you wouldn't have the map change, you, it would be even better to go down because then you would have a lot of time to prepare the mm. coming legs but here you don't have anything to prepare so you have to the only thing you can do is to focus on the leg coming because it's the last one before the map change and uh, you can do that as good on the on the straight leg as if you go around because the visibility is you, you can see the street all the way almost from the straight route choice as well yeah, I'm really impressed with Hannah Limbo's confidence. She, as we said, she's she's still a junior, and she's one who's really progressed a lot and, and um, jumped onto the scene after after the pandemic. And um, the fact that she's just 
really attacked the, the course. She's kind of gone for no regrets. And that's what really has impressed me every single time I've seen her race on this um, international circuit. And that, for me, is uh, very, very impressive, though. Um, and it means that she's rewarded with uh, still the leading time at the finish. She was what? She was our eighth starter. And that's a reflection. You know, she's, she's young. She's not been able to, to race much in the last couple of years. You know, she, she doesn't have many world ranking points. So that's why she's starting so early and has put in a great performance. But as we can mm. see, Ven Lahayu is uh, dropping down here. More like kind of closer together. It's a shame. Um, you know, we have seen Ven Lahayu get some great results, particularly in middle distance before. Um, but not the greatest start there. And I think, I think we'll really see some kind of good post-race analysis. Watch out for some post-race analysis. Um, specifically on controls one to two because I think a lot of people will have just thrown their whole run away uh, for, for that con control as well. Ingrid Lindenez then here uh, across the line into 15th place and she is uh, 22 minutes slower than Hannah Lindbergh at the moment. Of course, she was part of that group we saw in this Bermuda Triangle area around control 14 to 15, just not knowing where she was alongside, I think, Lena Sedebe and uh, it's one of the Russians as well. I think uh, yeah. Yulia Novikova was and there too. But Here you can see you're in the area. Oh, you see Hawkstone doing a big mistake there. And that's exactly what they meant when I said that uh, Benjaminson headed more to the east to get the small path there. Because she, she noticed that she isn't sure about uh, the distance and everything, so she really wanted to get to this small path, and that's the reason why she just headed towards uh, mm -hmm. east to get it. And Hockstrom kind of stayed in the slope for yeah too much t for too long time and uh, did a big mistake there. Yeah, that's huge. And I think if you want to be aiming off to one side or another, if you're going straight, you want to be aiming off to the right-hand side to try and pick up that path and then get, get yourself uh, onto that control. But poor, there's some serious damage done by being too low in the slope, not quite having your distance there and, as well. And that's another reason why it would be so good to... I mean, why it was so smart of Hannah Lundberg to choose the other route choice because it's, it's so much easier... 80% uh, of the leg to go uh, more to the west there and stay uh, underneath this slope and then attack it from below. You get it kind of you get a path pointing into the right direction almost all the way, and then you have mm -hmm. to do the last meters uh, where you have to really have to do the orienteering. That's something you skip on the other route choices, but with this on this level of I mean, everyone here is kind of world-class and they should be able to attack mm. a control from below uh, for 200 meters, like in a distance of 200 meters. So they shouldn't be afraid of that. Do you think too many of the athletes are going, right, it's Scandinavian terrain, straight is great. It's not the Czech Republic where we had to do lots of route choices. It's back to straight is great orienteering. That is the tactic I'm going to have. Well, that is how you orientate best in this terrain and, and therefore just not really thinking about a route choice. For me, I think I can imagine that the model event, I mean, everyone is running the model event here and it was just on the other way uh, of the start. It was 180 degrees from the start. So it was very close to the, uh, to the competition area. And I guess that the runnability there was really good and that you could uh, that, like the fastest way was always almost always to go straight and then when you come uh, into this competition situation and you have a very short first leg you don't have a chance really to get into the map mm -hmm. uh, to adapt to the terrain and then you see you have this long leg and you just everything you've learned from the from the model event was that you have to go straight and mm -hmm. then it's a difficult decision to not do that on the other hand yeah. it's you have the chance to choose a path that's pointing in exactly the direction uh, 
um, where the control is. I mean, I'm not surprised really that they're runners. It's not adding many meters, you know. It's only no, adding exactly. like 200 meters to your distance. Like, yeah, two, about 200 meters. And by and the time I mean, you've got to wiggle around all those hills in the straight line, like, you, you may as well run 200 meters extra on, on a leg that's two kilometers. I mean, you can do... Um, I can understand that runners are choosing to go straight because it looks good on the map but I'm surprised that almost everyone is doing it yeah you can see Simone Abersold there we haven't seen through I think yet I think we're, we're live with her now so she'll be one of the next ones we see through to control number five and she at the moment is the closest one we haven't got all the runner we haven't got all the runners mm. though uh, on we that don't have the in here. Exactly. So we can see Lena Strand is already behind. Caroline Olsen is already behind. Sabina um, Hauswitz, who we just saw through, about kind of three and a half minutes down, is um, behind there. It's only Absold who's in contention there. And of course, we need to reflect back on Hannah Lundberg's race. She had a big mistake in to control 14. A few other kind of smaller misses as well. Here we have Benjaminson, who is um, much closer than... I think she was about 48 seconds, something like that, behind... Um, Behind Lundberg right. at number five, where we got the when we got the time check there. So those two, it looks like at the moment, the only two who are really close. We're live with uh, Abersold, so the blue line there. That's who is live. Everybody else is synchronised to her. It looks like no issues there. This looks like Lena Strand then here, also towards the fifth control, and we can see by the the tracking there that she is. Uh, we're a long way behind, maybe four mm -hmm. minutes by the time and we get to the control. And how has she been caught pretty much yeah, already? Exactly. Yeah. And I yep. mean, that's Here's brutal. I think it's mostly due to the route choice to the second control. And um, I mean, it's it's hard to see that if you start it OK, more or less, you don't have to, you don't know that the other route choice was faster to the second control. And then you have already a runner. Uh, catching you at control 5, that's quite a difficult situation and of course it's exactly the other way around for the Abersold. Uh, mm -hmm. She had a good start and then she can... Uh, I don't know if she already can spot Strand in front of her, maybe in a, in a more open area she will get the possibility to do so but for her it's really good I mean she knows it's it's a Swedish runner running on home soil uh, it's a runner who is very good in long distances mm -hmm. that's won uh, medals before at world championships and that gives you of course uh, yeah it gives you a lot of confidence for the rest of the race here Yep, well, here's Lena Strand then, who is about to be caught, we must guess, by Simona Abersold, just coming mm -hmm. into this fifth control very shortly. There it is. But I mean, she's, I, I guess she's still on a okay position. I mean, she still top 10 maybe at that point, maybe top 15. And Abersold goes through, yep, third place. So Benjaminson and Abersold, the two closest so far. We've still, of course, got Natalia Gempel, Tova Alexanderson to come through this first split. Mm. And let's have now, a little look. That's interesting. Now we see that both Benjaminson and Abersold go straight. Uh, and now here you have this small path pointing in exactly the direction you have to run. Um, you can continue here, you have the marsh, we know that marshes are quite good to run on, it's open terrain there, and now she's heading up into the slope. Uh, in my opinion, she could have stayed below for a bit longer, but that's okay, she had to, I mean, she didn't miss the control at, at all. You see, that's, I mean, that's more or less the reason why she is... 48 or 55, uh, 54 seconds in front of the two other runners here. Yeah, and she had really good direction up the slope then into control number two as well, which really, uh, you know, she didn't didn't make any errors on that. That's like the hardest bit of actually executing that 
that leg to control number two, just making sure you've got your direction correct, going up that quite steep slope there and just absolutely, absolutely nailed it. And having the, having the guts to, to go the, the non-obvious way and, and back yourself on the running, you can see just the length of the, the tails we had on the GPS there, just how much further she's running in that three minutes that we, that we can see on that tail. And that is really uh, impressive there too. So Natalia Gempelatova Alexanderson I will be the next two to see through here. Uh, through to control number five, the two last starters, but we're still not going to them yet. This looks like Andrea Benny Minson running down towards control number 11 then here the Norwegian. So we know she was one of the only ones within kind of touching distance of Hannah Lundberg and you can see at control number nine she was a minute and 29 seconds down and we've got to say Hannah Lundberg we know she's made about a two minute error into control number 14 and that is the one that I think is going to really prove to be significant um, for the Swede uh, when she matches up with all of these later runners as well but Benjaminson is still kind of dropping time here actually and maybe she will be two minutes down by the time she gets to this control control number 11 and then it's going to be very very close with Hannah Lundberg so we will um, wait and see so Benjaminson goes second here one minute 51 seconds down it's looking even better and better for Hannah Lindbergh here. She's going to be maybe watching some of the race from the leader's chair and, I don't know, maybe maybe feeling a bit nervous as she sees her. You know, when you finish as one of the early starters, you've got your time, uh, 92 minutes, 23. You don't really know how it's going to match up compared to the others. You just, yeah, you don't know. But hang on, is that Alexanderson having caught to Natalia Gempler? I believe it is. And if Natalia Gempel is two minutes and five seconds behind, then Tova Alexanderson must be a minute in front. Could also be uh, men starting or running there. Don't really know. Yeah, I'm surprised because we're not see. actually following. If I feel like we would be following Tova Alexanderson if that was her. Certainly a Swedish kit. But Natalia Gempeler, yeah, we can see her actually. She is uh, like two minutes down. Two minutes down, but still in fourth place, though. So I think that shows you those top three have done really, really well in that first that first section, particularly that long leg to control number two. And Gempler into fourth place currently. Emma Biesmo, her early time is uh, still stacking up very well. And we just now have to wait for Alexanderson to see what she can do. Mm, here she here is she already. Gets. So let's see now. Control three, it was plus four seconds. So Tova Alexanderson yeah. not leading. Yeah, and that proves us how good the start of Hanna Lundberg really was here. I mean, uh, of course, uh, I guess that Ale Alexanderson went straight as well to the second control, but still the speed must have been really good by Hanna Lundberg. Oh, but she will just go into the lead now. There's two seconds. So pulled up six seconds from three to five. Alexanderson looking just kind of stable, making it look very, very easy through there. And that is what she likes to show us. So Alexanderson, the only one to have gone quicker than our current leader, Hannah Lundberg, at this split at control number five. And those are the standings. I think we've really got that group of four out in the front now. Alexanderson, Lundberg, Benny Minson and Abersold are those ones that at this point have have really had an impact on the race but you know we saw Hannah Lundberg's two minutes at control number 14 there's a lot of possibility for all those other ones and then there's a lot there you can just see around this point between uh, position 10 and position 20 all really really close to each other and uh, that could you know prove pretty interesting here just such a stacked field <laughs> apart from those four um who are who've been leading it out then really really 
close times in all of these, we will see how that kind of works itself out. By the time they get all the way around this course, 12.8 kilometers, 400 meters of climb, 200 meters of that is on the way up after the map exchange, and that is uh, pretty intense. But Hannah Limbo is just, just getting comfortable there with the furs, just because she's been sat there for a long, a long part of this afternoon. But we're now back up in this Bermuda Triangle area that looks like Vendula Horchichkova. Mm. And she doesn't look as com comfortable as uh, Hannah Lund Barry here. Let's see. She also, she is doing a mistake here. Going back again. Not really checking the map. Uh, in, like, she was running into the direction, then changed back again without checking the map. It's kind of, I get the same feeling. As for Yanosikova, that she, dis she doesn't really have a concept here what to do. No, it's when you're searching or you're looking for the control rather than navigating to the control, using your map to get to the control. Mm, no, she and we've seen lots of people do it. We'll see a lot more people do it before, they, before this race is up, I'm sure. Mm, and now she's following uh, the runner there from the men's race, I guess, mm -hmm. hoping for the same control. Here we are. Control 14. And luckily they do have the same control, the men's and the women's um, runners at this point, though they won't know it, of course. They'll know that, as it tends to be in a World Cup or Champs race, that you have quite a lot of common controls, and especially actually ones where there's cameras. But... You don't, you don't want to bank on that. You don't want to rely on that <laughs> assumption. It's interesting. She's not really a lot of map contact there. She's not reading the map very often. Now it was the first time after quite many meters. We've seen other examples before where Runners had their eyes glued to the map in this area. But I guess it's a bit more, you know, rocky and craggy. You've got to make sure you know exactly where you're going. But, uh, yeah. Mm, I think she spotted the other runner and could see the control ca quite early. Let's see if it's the same here out from the control. It's really relying on direction here. We can uh, keep that in mind and compare to other runners we will see later. I guess we will see many of the competitors reading the map more often uh, in this area there. Okay, so first kind of proper look at this uh, longer leg, kind of parallel to the lake side. Hannah Lundberg, we know, has gone straight. It's good visibility, it's good runnability on these lower slopes close here, but we have seen quite a lot of people going down to the road. You'll we'll be able to get some good speed on there, but there's no advantage of being able to read ahead, and you have mm. got more climb as well. You have 50 meters to climb up there. That's tough. And, uh, I mean, we know, we have seen the terrain towards Control 11. It's very open. Um, it's quite fast. You can, uh, yeah, you can lift your head and look forward into the terrain, so you know where to go to. And um, I think it's a good choice to stay up there, straight on. And now uh, we get the chance again. Now we see that Hanna Lundberg is a bit going around there, maybe avoiding this up and downs. This is a smart thing. Now she gets over this hill and then she gets on the other side of this rivulet. She gets to the stone there and using this one to correct direction here. Now she will just head back towards the red line. Uh, all the way actually to the red line and then exactly at the point where she gets there she starts to 
kind of get back into the old pattern and falling too much to the to the east there. Now she would have to have the chance there to with these two stones to correct direction. Now she's heading towards control 15. We don't know. Maybe she can see runners there running into the direction. Um, actually, I doubt that because she comes from below and visibility is low. But it's kind of you could see that she had this direction before. Then she cor corrected it and she got into the same pattern again. Uh, and we know that she lost about two minutes there. Yeah, and it's and I think she she started to deviate from that line pretty much where the sto the slope got steeper, which is where we think that that's where the visibility just suddenly gets a, that lot lower as well. So um, really, really tricky stuff. And mm. Jano Bear, you can see from and the split, she's had an absolute mare between five and nine, but look, then pretty consistent at, from then on in. Look at the map reading now for her compared to what we've seen before now mm. she's looking down now she's looking down now yep, again. again so that's uh, that's yep, two again. totally different styles uh, before we've seen a runner relying really on direction and kind of hoping to see the control when she gets close maybe she no she uh, has a picture in her head about how it should look like around the control, but I mean this is a very risky uh, style of orienteering in such a detailed area. So I kind of prefer the way uh, Hanna Öberg is orienteering there. Benjaminson then here in to control number 13. This is the arena passage. She's just taking on some gel i think looks mm, like she's, she's been a bit injured uh, got some yeah not great uh, but she is 47 seconds behind uh lundberg here and this is even before we've had this, this mistake then from uh, control number 14 so looking good for benjaminson here a strong second place you see four minutes ahead of third place there she's picking up her new map will continue to follow these tapes uh, out of the this kind of map exchange zone, this arena zone. You can see those red tapes kind of stretching into the distance. Mm -hmm. And there you'll see what, what she can do. And let's see where jo Joanna uh, Aubert lost loads of time because suddenly she was like from three minutes down to seven minutes and yeah. it was somewhere between five and nine, I think. Getting Oof. low here towards control six. Um, kind of unnecessary because just out from the control the visibility is good there and then here also avoiding this climbing but she's running around very much there again ending up too much to the south having to go back there yeah that's not not the best part of the race for her here for sure no but from then on she was quite consistent and not really dropping many seconds compared to the lead so i think that really shows you something as well here is a big group is that paula gross there yes it is And at least from this stretch, 14 to 15, it's the same as the men's, and then they will do a little bit different. But you can see she is still 15 minutes slower than Hannah Lundberg here. But looking pretty good going uh, across this slope. Mm. Quite some company there Just as well. Yeah, you see her just checking the control code um, on her on her arm as she uh, approached the control, and now you know she's got that confidence. She knows the direction um, out of the control. That's really really strong, and uh, mm -hmm. of course isn't put off when all the men go the other way. And it uh, actually proves that she has control over the situation. She didn't follow the others out of the control. She was uh, sure about her direction, so that was really good there. Here we see a small mistake by Simona Abersold as well. Maybe we get a chance to see where Benjaminson got closer to Hannah Lundberg. 
see that uh, Abersol is going more to the north there, getting a bit more climbing. Yeah, but both of them now trying to avoid this like that spur, like in ah yes, mistake by Benjaminson getting to the stone there that saved her situation, mm -hmm. so she could uh, relocate. And then here we have a mistake by Hanna Lundberg. Mm -hmm. So that's the reason why uh, the others get closer here. So she had kind of two situations where she opened up again for the others to get closer uh, to her. In between, she always had really good parts and was running really fast but here at control 9 and control 14 she's losing time yeah and you can see on the way to uh what was it control number eight they've there's this big spur that comes about a third of the way through that leg and you've that's actually quite a few contours to climb you've got to choose which way round you want to you want to go there just of course Seta said it feel, just looks like a big wall in front of you and you've got to make a decision which is why we see quite a lot of the runners going off the straight line uh, to control number eight you want to try and uh, minimize the amount of climb you have to take lots of kahula there here into the 15th control or the 14th her, and the 15th control her eyes were suspiciously uh, heading towards the camera person mm -hmm. there i think she was quite sure about that uh, you will see the control from the camera position. And she's really looking around her a lot. You can see, again, if we look at the different styles, one thing to really mm -hmm. notice is where, where the runner's eyes are. And she is looking around her a lot here. Then it's she run quite a long way before looking at the map again. Mm. She's kind of more a stop and go uh, kind of orienteering. So she, when she stops, she tries to memorize uh, the terrain that she wants to see. And then she's running uh, until she gets there. And then she stops again and tries to get further and always uh, yeah she kind of uh, splits up the control in small parts and tries to execute it like this so now we have already three different kinds of orienteering here on this <laughs> short leg mm -hmm. yeah it's really it's really good you know this leg's really good to see the, the different types of orienteering that people are doing and is it still which ones do you still still think is the best? Um, well, I, I think it's either the stop and go or the read the map almost all the time kind of style. The, the advantage with the stop and go is that you kind of can focus on the running in between your small steps you're taking between the controls and then you stop and you keep on doing it. Uh, the advantage with the one where you run and read the map all the time is that you get kind of a, a, a good rhythm and you feel confident. But that really demands that you have good control over the situation and that you're able to slow down exactly as much until you get into the position where you actually can be uh, ahead with your map reading compared to like your running. You, you have always been you you have to be a step in front with the map reading and that's not really easy in this kind of terrain and simona abersol through that control just looked spectacular just no hesitation taking on the water punching the control got the direction no hesitation whatsoever picked the speed right back up from having to slow down at the control and for me that looked really really strong and she's caught some good time up there again on um, on Lindbergh, you know, after that mistake that we saw from her to control number nine, so catching up there and looking good compared to Benny Minson as well, so for me really, really promising there. Back at the finish though, here's Serena Kiberts, goes into the fifth spot here, but still big, big gaps and for the finishers at this point, she finishes in fifth and we are quite much above the expected winning time here as well um, still, but I think it's, yeah.
Yeah, it was a bit optimistic, the calculation before the race. <laughs> Uh, they were actually they were talking about uh, that yesterday in the meeting with the course planner and uh, Per Forsberg uh, asked Matthias Carlson if it uh, 80 minutes if they weren't a bit optimistic or it seems to be quite fast and uh, Matthias Carlson's answer was just yes <laughs> yes it is fast it is fast. Um, but yeah, if we have Hannah Lundberg going 92 minutes, um, we have seen some mistakes, but she's got good speed. I don't think we're going to get much under 90 minutes, I think. Maybe, you know, Alexander, we know she's a very special runner, but uh, still, you know. So there was a mistake we could, we could see from Miranova, Svetlana Miranova there, punching into seventh place. Here we go, there she is. Um, just heading out of control, number 15 now. She again got too far to the right, I think, there. I, I know she's Are leaving the control. Yeah. yeah, she's leaving, leaving the control now to control 16, so I think this is, uh, yeah. this was okay, actually. Do you think a lot of the runners here are heading to the right? Do you think if you're likely to kind of aim off one way or another, you want to go in the direction you know, of where more controls are rather than aiming no, kind of left? I think the the reason is because you uh, we've seen many times now that there's kind of groups coming from the control out towards the next control. Mm. And when you come from above, you see them running into this direction and uh, it kind of attracts you into their tracks to follow them because mm -hmm. if you're then you're up there and you know okay it's either to the left or to the right um i think that's the reason why they get yeah the tendency is that they get too much to the right there getting into their uh tracks to the next control but the time loss here for mironova wasn't too big so i mean it's unnecessary but it's not so it's not two minutes yeah yeah, Megan Carter Davis will just go in the top 20 in there. Maybe a bit disappointed for her. She managed to make the top six at the uh, World Championships, but a bit of a trickier day uh, in the forest there for Meg. Mm, I think also that the kind of style of orienteering that it was needed in the Czech Republic suited her a bit better. I, uh, as I experience her, she's quite a physically strong runner and. There you had this chances that you had you were you had the chance to push really hard on the route choices once you decided them and here you kind of have to yeah you have to do the map reading all the time and you never really get the chance to really play your card when your strength is in the physical part especially on the paths. Yep. I think well said. Here's Tova Alexanderson though into uh, split number two. And look, it's still really, really mm -hmm. close here. She's heading all the way down to control number 11, but still matching the time pretty much of uh, Hannah Lundberg there. But we, and even with actually, even with Hannah Lundberg's mistake into mm -hmm. control number nine. So that's really interesting to see them there. She must have done a mistake as well here because mm -hmm. we have seen uh, Hannah Lund, but it did uh, uh, no, about two minutes mistake there. Uh, one and a half, two minutes, and now it's but still she's only 15 seconds ahead, so there must have been something here for Tove Alexanderson as well. Yep, I think we can probably say that. we. I think on terrain like this where you can really get the speed up we know she's really good in the in the tough technical terrain but her her speed is is so quick and she's got those long legs she can just as you see here just kind of bounce across this terrain then um you know that is you, i would expect her to pick up more time than that maybe i've got very high expectations of course for alexanderson she didn't win uh, all five goals at, in the world champs for for no reason a small no, that's not miss there for gemper oh no uh, that's that's a quite a big miss for gemper i was going to say it was a small one but that's that is significant there about to say it's not a good sign when you get into the picture here into the gps <laughs> replay compared to hannah lund uh, so mistake to the sixth control she was very close to the control there so that's another indication uh, of the fact that it's quite dense there and visibility is low let's see here also she 
is heading down very much. Oh, that's not good. Ooh. And now it's, it will be really difficult to relocate oh, here. No. Because even if you see the, the street down there, uh, it doesn't help here. It looks all the same, unless it's just a straight... Street and now it looks there. like you could be in the in the reentrant by control number ten, and those like the forks of the streams and everything, and you uh, think you, know, you have making a big parallel error. That is, she was on direction for about a third of that leg, and then it was just like, now I'm going to forget my compass. Yeah. And yes. um, the I was really very bad, surprised. the really bad thing for her is. I mean, it's quite obvious that it's bad for her that she's off so much, but it will take her a long time to realize mm. that she really is off that much. Uh, it looks quite the same. She will notice that she did a parallel mistake there, um, but it will take some time until she noticed that it was actually that she's that much off direction. And uh, I don't know, that's this, yeah, this. That's not good. It's not good <laughs> no, for that her. Is, that is and it's huge. really not the situation. I think that's one of the biggest situation. mistakes we've seen yeah. so far. I'm sure we, ha we haven't seen a lot of the earlier runners, and I'm sure there's been some big mistakes in there, but it's, that is it's this pretty kind, massive. It's this kind of thing where you, later on in the evening, look at the map and you just can't find a reason why this, how this could happen. That's just... How could how, she will ask herself how, how could it happen that I just ran so straight down the hill without noticing? Well, it just looks like a lapse of concentration to me. A okay, let's let's go. Let's we're, we're continue going straight. You're going downhill. Maybe the visibility is good. You kind of kid yourself with going in a particular way, and um, yeah. Oh, a little miss there for which I hadn't spotted there for Lundberg into number yeah. twelve. And it was not Think quite it perfect was, for Benny Minson either. Yeah, but it was quite okay that she had a dump into the slope early there. Mm. Didn't do, um, didn't stay quite too long on, on it. Yeah. Now she's getting closer here, and for sure, if she is not doing a mistake here, she will pass and take over the lead at control 14 be interesting to see still looks very good here she's on track maybe she gets this small hill there that looks very yeah. promising i guess we will see her in the picture soon here we have her yeah she is yeah so definitely very good and actually sticking very very close to the line going up the hill which we haven't really seen from many people she was mm. going up and down over those hills that are right on the red line but actually it pays off because she's got the uh, navigation really, really accurately. So it was uh, she was 47 seconds slower than Lundberg. So we're going to get the time at the next control and we'll see mm. how far she must be ahead now. Yeah, she's looking good there. way ahead looking now. Very good. Under what she's done there, something in her face. Maybe she got some her nose bleeding or. Yeah, I think it looks like something that's made her quite bloody, but I don't think it's going to be a big old injury. We don't think we're going to have to see anybody's like knees being stitched up like we saw from uh, <laughs> the world champs. I think the middle distance was one of the men. I forget who it was. Yeah, um, Albin Riedefeld it was. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> yeah, I think he did have ah. to have some stitches, but whoa, look at that. Nice. Whoa, she's... So I th maybe that mistake from Hannah Lundberg is more than we thought. Yeah, that's and four I mean, minutes she's gained there. This is really uh, an example of how you should be orienteering here in this uphill. She, you could see that she she really got this small hill, uh, just in the yellow part as an attack point when she got a bit to the left of the. Yeah, now I look at this. Gempele again. Maybe we'll see. The mistake. I just want to finish what I was saying. You could really see that she had a plan all the way up there, Benjaminsen, and then executed it very well to the control, exactly as you should do it. And let's see if she got control over the situation here, Gempel. She's way off here. Still, this is, I mean, this is brutal. She's there, and she, now she is looking for all the features close to the control where. It could look as it looks in the terrain where she is, but she will, like, maybe she will get it more or less to fit, uh, and that would be, <laughs> that would be even worse for her. But uh, 
Because she thinks I don't she's know, kind maybe... of on the spur next to the, like, just west of well, the control. It's and... hard to know, but oh. I'm 100% sure that she it will take a while until she gets, uh, yeah. like... The idea that she could be so far off. I don't know, maybe we'll even see her going down to the street. Yeah, because you just don't believe that you are that far away from the control because yeah. you'll have been confident that your that your execution up to reasonably near the circle has gone okay, but that is why on a on a slope like that, you're traversing down the slope, there's not very many features in there to kind of keep you on track. It's very easy to have a lapse of concentration, do something slightly wrong and be off by that much. But look at them again, those standings at split number four. Andrina Benjaminson really now taking control of this race, having seen Hannah Lumbe leading for a long time. And there are, you know, there's, there's still a good few controls left to go. So we will have mm. a look. Let's have another replay then to compare. These are top and our, our leaders and look at that. Controls um, look at this now. 13 to she 15. There's this small hill where she is right now. I guess that was very mm -hmm. helpful to get as an attack point. She, she knows where she is now. She's heading up there. Maybe she sees the spur there and heading towards the control. That's really good. Very well executed. No problems to control 15. Of course, there are many other runners there as well. It's a good direction to 16. No problems there. I yeah. think she came into this re-entrant and followed it up uh, I mean mm -hmm. maybe two or three seconds but kind of a safe way to attack it to get down into the re-entrant and then run up there I think it was very yeah. very good very well done there and I think you're really good to pick out that that small hill with the, the open area on the way into control number 14 for me that's like one of the most unique features in that terrain and something that does that would hopefully stand out and she's really using that as a good kind of attack point to get into the control. So Cecilia freeberg Klusner then is also here at control number 14, the Dane. Felt like a lot of the Danish team kind of kind of stepped up a little bit of a level at these uh, world championships, but uh, Klusner maybe not having the best day in the forest there. She don't think she'll end mm. up being uh, the best Dane despite starting last out of all of their women so yeah tough and you, you can see she's kind of i think lacking in confidence here at this point she's yeah you can around a lot you can see that at the body language uh now let's see here that's uh see usually it's okay, not a very good sign mistakes, yeah no, exactly <laughs> um also, she is having okay direction here in the beginning. Now she gets into this a lot of up and down there. Rutnaya going more to the north first, but then getting back into this area. So it was kind of unnecessary to do. He's be going a bit much to the east there. Off direction. Same for Rutnaya. Wonder if they were together maybe. Yes, that's what I was just thinking. I think they maybe were together. Yes, they are. Have a look. Yeah, they are together. There we go. Elisa Rizvi having caught up Anastasia Rudnaya, but Andrina Benjaminson has caught both of them and overtaken them because we've already seen her through at this point, um, particularly. So, yes, not not great yeah, there. Did, and when you're, you know, you're crossing see. and you cross that path, you've got to know where you are on that path. Yeah, and here we have it. She was five minutes and eight seconds behind. Now she lost almost, yeah, she lost more than three minutes. Towards control 14. Different directions here. Interesting. And the two of them will be running, just they'll be able to hear the other one in the distance and see them out the corner of their eye. You've just got to be really careful through here. But that looks like just dropping into the control. So, good line from Risby. Mm, but she lost a lot of time in the uphill <laughs> there and especially close to control 14. We didn't really see um, the part when she kept 
close to the control, but we saw that she got off direction there towards control 14. Yeah, just a reminder, this bit here is probably the most difficult bit of the course. They've just had a climb mm. up 200 meters. Oh, should we keep track on Gempler? We'll break off that yeah, thought. I want to know if uh, Natalia Gempler has managed to figure out where she is. This is a huge parallel error. Mm. I think she thinks she's quite near the control there on the spur. Yeah. You've got the foot in there. Oh, no. I was going to say, has she realized there? I mean, that's that's exactly what I... Then she noticed, okay, m maybe I dropped down too far towards control 9. And then she... Okay, then I have to go quite a lot uh, towards south to get to the control. But, th of course, she doesn't go far enough because she's so off direction there. Yeah, that is really tough. Maybe she's, I think she's probably managed to figure out and she looked like she was in the right direction back to the control again there. But um, into the finish then, Lotta Kahola here. Finns have been doing pretty well so far. But again, look, you can still be 10 minutes behind and be fitting into this um, top five uh, at the moment. Top six, surely, and just this, this short section now down to the bottom of the hills was the finish. So Lotta is going to be, yep, into fifth place. So nine and a half minutes behind the time of Hannah Limbe at that point, but still a really credible fifth place at the moment. Lots of long times out there in the forest, and we've, we've already kind of discussed, I think it's going to be a little bit longer winning time than we expected. Oh, estimated winning time, 80 minutes, our current leading time, as you can see here. One hour, 32.23, with Emma Biesmo, the second quickest, still five minutes down. We're waiting for some of the really quick athletes, though. We've got Andrea Benjaminson. We've seen her through the, the last TV control. She'll be down at the finish very shortly. We've got Simona Abbasod there. And, of course, we've got our last starter, Tova Alexanderson. She is, of course, leading the World Cup standings, having won all the races at the World Championships. But... Really, really spread times uh, here. Susan Lush, uh, particularly good there, make, currently in that uh, top 10. And uh, we'll see uh, as the times progress down there. We've got big teams here, you know, so we can see a lot of the top nations, I'm sure, will be kind of packing those, those top spots. The men's class, I can tell you, at the first tier fit, we have Isak from Kusikana, Sweden, in lead. Eight seconds down to Simon Imark, also Sweden. Thomas Kridda in third, 26 seconds behind. Only Oyanao in fourth, and Simon Hector in fifth position. And right there, I got the time from Isak from Kusikana to the second tier fit for the men. And he is now in third position, 56.30. One minute and five seconds behind Hovard Sansa Eiko from Norway. Still the fastest to the second team. Okay. Having a look now at the very last part of Hannah Lundberg's race, comparing it to Mirinova, I think we'll soon see the Russian uh, down at the finish. You can see her just how much her speed increased from 19 to 20. Mirinova using that hill nicely into the control itself into 19 and that kind of really even if you've maybe lost your direction a bit there if you've got that path just before the control you can there's a lot of features there you can use to help figure out mm. how high up the slope you are so that one's i think is, is you know really a pretty easy control and then yeah. you are down the slope again into you'll be able to see all the spectators in the arena <laughs> it's it's not the trickiest end to a course and it we we also saw uh, the terrain from control 12 to 13 mm -hmm. it's very open there so as you, as you mentioned this control shouldn't be a problem at all no and um, we'll soon see the Russian then into the finish 
it's just so happens I think some of these broadcasts we we happen to see some people a lot around around this this course, and we've seen a lot of Svetlana Miranova. She's not done. I mean, she's done kind of average, but um, we will soon see her kind of descend on this slope. There she is. You can just see her going through the trees there, and this really gorgeous um, lower part of these slopes. I mean, she will be around uh, top six, top seven. So it was quite an okay race, but still. I mean, the gap is so big. Uh, I think that's why you said it was kind of an average race, but I mean, the position was, is okay here uh, in the finish. Yeah, I guess I uh, shouldn't uh, do her down. It's a pretty good position to finish. She, of course, has, uh, is a former world champion at this distance back in 2014 in Italy. And really is one of the more experienced members of the Russian team. Here is another member of the Russian team who <laughs> hasn't had a Finally. good day in there, but she is back here. We're following her down to control number 11. But my goodness me, Natalia Gempola has had an adventure in the forest today. Yeah. Um, a parallel error, but a big, big parallel error. She was a long way uh, away yeah, from the control, and it took her a long time to find a way back. It started to feel like a column in our uh, program here that we come back to her every fifth minute <laughs> and uh, take a look on how it's going for her. You could also see that she was heading down to the uh, to the street there. I think she, yeah, she lost a lot of self-confidence towards this control, so she will save it up now when, whenever she gets the chance. Rio Larson here. This is. Uh I think a surprise to see her so far down the results here. She had some good results um, in the World Championships. She was looking uh, pretty good in the big part of the, um, you know, she was seventh in the long distance, 11th in the middle distance, part of the team that won the bronze medal in the relay. So pretty disappointing then uh, for, I think, Olausen. I think it's safe to say. Sarah Hagstrom as well is on her way to split number four. And where did we see a mistake from her? We definitely we, saw Yeah, towards control two. She did a big mistake when she was too far oh, down in the slope there and missed the small path. You can see it here. It's eight minutes yeah. and 40 seconds at control three. From that point, actually, she had... She only lost three minutes, but you can see there it didn't look so smooth up there. I know that she had some back problems at the World Champs or just before. Yeah, and she wasn't quite, maybe didn't quite have the picture in her head of, of where exactly that control she'd be. She was kind of hesitating just a few steps outside of it, knew it was in the very, very close vicinity, but not right on there at this point and you can see she's just checking maybe the descriptions there on her wrist the control code just to be very very careful and to be accurate and to get that good picture of what the control should look like when she gets there Looking quite focused, you know, not looking around mm. too much uh, like we've seen some of the others. Keeping her head up, but not kind of, not not looking kind of to her left and to her right like we've seen some of the others do. And a really good um, flow through that control as well. Mm. It looked it looked very good here actually. I was just uh, hesitating mm. a bit in the beginning because it, the one step she took up the rock there, it looked at, as if she was a bit out of balance uh, for a second I was a bit afraid that she would have some pain there but maybe as I said maybe she was just out of balance but there uh, the control taking to control 15 was really good actually yep Elena Ross here then big part of the Swiss team particularly strong as a sprinter but not bad in the forest either she too is going to again be around that kind of 10, 11 minute mark and going to be just making it into the top 10 currently. Eleanor Ross there finishes 
11 minutes and about 20 something seconds behind <laughs> you've got that that leaderboard there straight away but here we go here's Andrina Benyamin Minson and what is her time going to be is she going to be the first one to knock Hannah Lundberg off the top spot I think it is looking very good for Andrina Benyamin Minson the Norwegian here she's going to go and cross the line got so much speed coming over the line and let's take the new fastest time here three minutes and 12 seconds then quicker than Hannah Lindbergh quite mm. and really we can say for for Lindbergh it was that mistake then into control 14 that has cost her that that lead basically because Benny Minson was actually a little bit slower from 15 onwards only by a few seconds uh, compared um, compared to the Swede and I think mm. yeah we can have a little look at yeah. both of their routes there's that's the impact have, of the mistake yeah this was the decisive moment maybe already a bit before when she got off direction Anna Lundberg towards control 14 uh, and then you saw that we could see the mistake there at 14 she also had a mistake earlier uh, to control 8 or 9 it was uh, in the downhill there but now, I mean, it was a great run by Hannah Lundberg. Mm. And now, after three hours in the leading <laughs> chair, she is heading over to Andrine Benjaminsen. Uh, and it was a good race by Benjaminsen. If she wouldn't, if she would have picked a good, the best route choice to control number two, this would be have been a great race. Now it's still quite open, but for sure there's a chance to end up top three here. Abasoldo has gone quickest now at control number 15. So will how long will Benny Minson be sitting in that leader's chair? Let's have a look at those three. These are our kind of current leaders at the moment. We've got Alexanderson mm -hmm. accepting. We will we will hold the tension for her. And Benny Minson, the only one dropping down, but she comes quite up from the track quite from the road quite yeah. early, and I think it's a good decision. Yeah, it's good, but at the same time, it's like if she goes up there so early, then she could have stayed up there from the beginning, more or less. <laughs> uh, we also saw that uh, Lundberg was doing a mistake there to control 12. Uh, so that's the reason why all the three of them are very close together here. So let's see how they... I mean, we know how Benjaminsen and Lundberg handled the situation to 14. Uh, Benjaminsen going to this small hill there, the yellow hill. Let's see if Abersolt... Uh, we didn't really see it there. This is Sabine Hauswirt. Yeah, and just you can see just gradually dropping some time throughout the whole course, I think, here for Hauswirt. And not quite the speed, you know, walking quite a few steps through just kind of out of that control uh, tells me she hasn't quite got as much confidence there. But then again, you know, actually, you, you the times are long, but the position's <laughs> still good, so... Uh, I don't know. And it's hard to know whether she, you're going to be satisfied with a race. When you, when you look back, you think, okay, the position's good, but oh, I was like 10 minutes behind mm, X it's, it person. Would, then it would ver be very interesting to see in the runners, into the runner's head when they come to the arena passage and get an indication about uh, both the position and the gap uh, Yeah, compared to the fastest runners. Because I... I don't know if it, how difficult it is to get a feeling about the time losses or about your running mm -hmm. speed here if you're all alone. And I mean, uh, when she hears that she's in position 5, I guess she would be quite sat satisfied. But uh, when she hears that it's 8.5 minutes, the gap to the leading Andrina Benjaminsen, then maybe she wouldn't be that satisfied anymore. It would be interesting to, to know a bit more about that, mm. but of course we will most probably never know <laughs> <laughs> exactly well um you can see olsen's being caught by housewit there you know she started three minutes ahead she's being caught uh so housewit will certainly get that feedback having caught carolyn olsen so that that is certainly a good thing but yeah still a, a big gaps and this is where we can see it 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 be kind of in place here so benjaminson 
is actually not the leader at the top of the hill. We've got Simona Abbasol, but Benny Minton is our leader at the finish. So we're going to compare uh, those GPS trackings with her. Mm. And a lot of them oh, sticking quite close to the line. House fit absolutely glued to that red line. Yeah, you can see that she is definitely using the compass to approach this control. So now she passes, she crosses this path here, then she has to really be sure where she is. Like everyone else going a bit much to the east there, is staying on the east side of the red line, but very good control taking there as well. Sabine Hauswert. Then Benny Minson, I think, doesn't... Hannah Lundberg, we saw her really direct on the line to control number 19, but Benny Minson goes a lot more kind of to the north at that point, and I think it's a little bit slower there, so that's, um, I think, lost a few seconds compared to Hannah Lundberg on that particular point. Denisa Kosova, then again into the finish, we'll just be outside uh, the top 10. Denisa Kosova into the finish, into 12th position right now in the current standings. So 12th is, is better than her 15th place at the World Champs, 8th uh, in the middle. So not bad time wise. And here is Alex Anderson. And we can look apart from control number three, where Hannah Lundberg was leading. We've got green all the way here for. <laughs> Tova Alexanderson. Mm, but still, it's only one and a half minute. Yeah, I mean, one and a half minute is a lot, but you can lose time here. And you see that she lost mm, time. She has. Um, it's definitely, she must have lost a minute at least here. So this is not over, that's for sure. <laughs> oh, oh, no. Hesitating and here. So she retains so. the leading position there, but has lost a minute and 20 seconds between the arena passage and this point here. So I'm sure soon we'll get a look at her GPS and see that comparison maybe with, with uh, Abersold and uh, with Benjamin Minson as well to see where those positions will go. Here's Lena Strand, though, in this Bermuda Triangle area. And she is looking... I think she's looking for control 14, but mm. she's been overtaken by Simone Abersold, by Tova Alexanderson, I was about to say by Natalia Gempler, but she hasn't been overtaken by Natalia Gempler after a bit of a, bit of a mare for uh, Gempler. But again, this just kind of feels like you're just looking around for the control mm. here. Not very much looking at the map. Trying Everything to find the same. Yeah, trying to find a feature to relocate uh, with, which isn't <laughs> too easy in that part there. And Gempler, 22 minutes down, but more importantly into 67th place. And that is the damage done by her mistake there. Now, Natalia Gempler is someone we always see with a big smile on her face when she finishes, but I'm not sure it will be the case today because a lot of damage has been done. She was in a good position. And that is really, yeah, it's really done a lot to her time there. Pretty drastic. Lena Strand then here. I think the control is just in the foreground here. Mm, quite a big mistake here. Mm -hmm. so yeah, lost about two 14. minutes, one and a half. Yeah, oh yeah, by the time she even gets to 15, yeah, she will be a few minutes. Lost, we'll have lost a few minutes. You see that the, also the men's race is starting to get into a later like kind of uh, situation in the race. There are not as many runners here anymore as we have seen like half an hour ago. And this for sure changes the situation uh, for the runners here. Because earlier you, when you were unsecure you could see uh, other runners and maybe you could kind of get a hint of which direction you should head to and now you don't get any help anymore mm. 
No, and your confidence is going to be high when you just made a you know a little mistake into control number 14. She was very close to the control, and now as you can see, just really checking her direction really really carefully, just stopping there just to make sure that it's that she's all online and got the right direction into control number 16. So those standings then at split four, that's control we've just seen uh, Lena Strand punch and it's Tova Alexanderson in the lead at that point. Simona Abersold only 16 seconds back and Alexanderson we know lost about a minute and 20 from the arena passage to that point. So Alexanderson not quite showing the dominance that she did at the World Championships. I mean, she's still in the lead though, so what really are we talking about? Then we've got Andrina Benny Minson, who is our leader at the finish uh, ahead of... Um, Ahead of Hannah Lundberg as well there. So those are the kind of top eight. So Andrina Benny Minson there looking comfortable in the lead, in the leader's chair alongside Lucas Leland. A bit of a mistake there for Lena Strand there at number 12. Just a few misses and this is really where we'll see uh, we know we're going to see her having a mistake then at control number mm. 14. Benny so Minson looking mm, really let's good Let's see here. Strand is going, uh, trying to avoid here the climbing. That's actually good in this position of the leg. Now okay, maybe staying a bit too much on the eastern side of the red line here. She could get a bit closer back. Now she heads up there. Still looking okay. Now she didn't really get uh, any attack point there. And then she's just somewhere around. Didn't know. Now here on the GPS it actually didn't look as a big mistake. But we saw her hesitating there. Mm -hmm. um, I mean it's it's summing up. If It sums up if you have uh, one mistake here. And then you have another one uh, before. And then it's it's just... Uh, this kind of terrain, it's it's brutal. If you're losing self-confidence, it just makes you lose more and more time. Lisa Rusby then here. And looks like she's made another mistake in the kind of after that TV split. We saw her <laughs> make a mistake kind of going into it and now dropping down. And we'll follow her all the way into the finish. She looks like she'll make top 15 at this point. But if we remember back to uh, the World Championships, she was uh, equal fourth in the long distance. So not quite as good a performance for Lisa Risby here today. And she's going to go there, 14th place. So just those 15 minutes behind Benjaminson at the moment. Okay, let's compare then. Uh, mm, would have been interesting to have uh, Tuve Alexanderson in this comparison as well. Don't really know where she I lost time there. I think we must have there. lost her GPS or something yeah. because we haven't seen that come up. That's true. So now we see... At this point, it looks actually very good for all three of them. Now we see that Lundberg is doing the mistake we were talking about many times here. Good control taking by both Abersold and Benjaminson. Maybe Benjaminson was, uh, in the end, she was a bit too far to the to the west up there. Um, but of course, I mean, this is five or ten seconds. It was good control taking by both Abersold and Benjaminson. So good to control 18 and I mean this is important the, we know that the gap between Abersold and Alexanderson was only 16 seconds uh, so good control taking to 18 and now on the last meters to wall, towards the as we mentioned before quite easy 19th control and then towards the finish and for me, Benjaminson has just lost a few seconds by staying too high uh, to this control number 19. She's just added a little bit of extra distance by going away 
from the red line and I don't think really gains anything. I think that control is easy enough that you can, yeah, I think you want to aim off a bit to the right, but not quite that far, to be honest. So that was uh, certainly, I don't, yeah, I don't think the right, the right approach there for Benjamin's and she may well have dropped that place. Sarah Hagstrom then here, as we mentioned, it was a mistake, a big mistake into control number two that has really uh, lost her a lot of time. She's actually had a not not too bad race uh, since then, especially in the last part of things, mm -hmm. but I don't know, she, but she's still going to go into sixth spot here. So Sarah Hagstrom has managed to, I think, claw, uh, kind of maintain some good positions or claw back some positions after a pretty disastrous number two. So. Without that, she would be in a pretty good place here at the finish. Not bad, though, for Sarah Hagstrom. So Sarah Hagstrom, Lisa Risby just uh, going through all the post-race download, getting all the masks and everything ready, taking out the GPS tracker too. And we'll really soon be, be seeing Simone Abbasold, I'm sure, down towards the finish. And then, of course, we'll just be looking for Tova Alexanderson left. A reminder of our current top three, Andrina Benny Minson in first, Hannah Lundberg in second, and Emma Biasmo in third place. But we are now waiting for Simone Abbasold, and you can see she was just slightly behind first Hannah Lindbergh and then behind uh, Andrina Benjaminson. This isn't her, this looks like Van der Haar, you, I think, uh, down through the forest here. But the then just green at the end for Simona Abbasol. So we'll see Van der Haar, you, the fin through here, but really shortly we'll see her coming through the trees. Oh, there she is, I think. That looks like slightly odd direction coming from a lot further left than I thought. So Abbasol here racing to see if she can overtake Benny Minson. Here's, our, here's Benny Minson, the leader. Two Norwegians on the leader's chair at the moment. And it's looking good for Simona Abbasol to take the leading spot currently with only Tova Alexanderson uh, left to go. The bronze medalist, of course, from the world champs long distance. She's going to upgrade today to be silver or better there. So the Swiss Simone Abbasold will cross the line. New fastest time then for her. Pushes Benny Minson down to second. Lundberg into third. One hour, 28, 31. Only mm -hmm. the 40 seconds quicker than Benny Minson with only Tova Alexanderson still to come. But something that might be decisive here in the fight for the victory today. She lost 16 seconds uh, from the pre-warning to the finish. You mentioned it. It was kind of a strange direction she was coming mm -hmm. from, losing 16 seconds there. Uh, otherwise, uh, we've seen that there was a mistake, or it was a mistake. She lost time to the second control on the route choice, and she had some problems on the loop, six, seven, eight. But after that, it was a re really good race, especially up there to control 14, 15. Um, so it was, a, it was a good race by her with some... Uh, she needed some time to get into it, and, but after halfway through it, she really got into the flow and uh, yeah, it will be tight between her and Tove Alexanderson for the victory. Yeah, so with uh, Natalia Gempel and Tove Alexanderson with the initial women starting uh, after Simona Abbasol, we know Natalia Gempler is is out of it, but Tova Alexanderson is the only one still to come. So six minutes, then she started after Simona Abbasol. So we've got about five minutes uh, yet to wait. And uh, those are our current standings at the finish. Hannah Lundberg, they're still in third, and I'm just looking back at her, res you know, results as a junior. She's done one junior world championships. Her best result being at seventh place in the middle distance. This is in Denmark two years ago. Uh, she was 15th in the sprint and 37th in the long. I don't know what she's been doing during <laughs> coronavirus, but my goodness me, it's been working. And and maybe you know she's just 
developed as an athlete, um, you know, getting older and, and developed in terms of strength wise or up to training because it's she's looked really strong and, and and I've been so impressed with her her commitment and her intent. She's not really played it safe. She's really attacked this course and yes, she's made a few mistakes, but I think, you know, more and more racing from her will allow her to kind of iron out those mistakes and I can see her being a really big talent coming up um, in, mm -hmm. in future races. And I mean, so far we have mostly seen her uh, doing well in sprint races and that's kind of the normal entrance for juniors to the senior level it's easier to get good results in the sprints in the beginning and then you kind of level up to the longer distances uh, but she is just jumping into it and also performing so good in long distance races. and it's really nice to see i mean as you mentioned uh, uh, she's not she's not a coward she is attacking those controls mm. uh, she she has no respect for or, or at least no uh, unnecessary respect for the terrain and uh, yes. she wants to be fast and that's something I really like uh, when you see her GPS here she's attacking all the way and then of course she did um, two mistakes today but hey everyone else was or almost everyone else was doing mistakes as well so uh, that was a very very good performance here yeah really really impressive um, and I, I think from results we've seen this year we're going to be talking about Hannah Neberg a lot um, coming up uh, and we also remind it, she's still a junior as well she's not actually a senior yet she is kind of running up here and for the pandemic uh, it is very very impressive and uh, and we you know with with a whole three races we kind of knew we'd see So here we have Hauswirt into fifth position, 10 minutes and 37 seconds behind. So let's see here, we have the comparison between the three runners, Benjaminsen, Abrisold and Lundberg. Here we see the route choice to the second control, Lundberg going more around, taking a less risky entrance to the second control, not having to run through the racket train to the second control. And uh, this is really a point where she could win time here compared to Abersold and Benjaminsen. Um, to keep it all the way to control three as well. Still no mistake here, no problems at all. Uh, you see here also that we don't have the GPS of Tuve Alexanderson. That's why we haven't seen her earlier in the race here. And we're still waiting for Tuve Alexanderson to come to the finish here. Uh, still have the GPS on here, but uh, actually we're waiting for Tuve Alexanderson to come to the last control and also to the finish. And I think something must have um, something must have gone wrong for Alexanderson here because mm. Pe 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 is trying to call something. We've got this GPS tracking and playing, and I don't know if we've seen already. Maybe I know Per Fulschberg is really good on his watches and he has maybe been timing <laughs> those six minutes between Abersold and Tova Alexanderson because he has been calling it and we're still looking for Alexanderson oy, into the oy, finish. Oy. Oy, and look, we can see control number 19. That's our pre-warning control. She is two minutes behind 
and Jans. I think is it the first, is it the first time this season she has not taken the win. So we're looking and there at um, to at um, Simona Aversold, who we've. Uh, certainly Per Fulsberg has given the win to her and Andrina Benjamins in their second place. And, and now, you know can you remember what the gap back was to Hannah Lundberg? Is she going to get a medal here today? Uh, no, the Hannah gap Lundberg was 3.52, yeah. so unlikely. Exactly. So, um, you know what's the worst thing about this? We won't see what happened because we, we don't see have the happened. GPS. No. And my guess is that it is control 18, the quite dense control, or maybe one of the mm. controls up there in the Bermuda Triangle, but maybe we will... Hopefully we'll get an interview and uh, get to know it, but here she is towards the finish. So she's fighting hard here and I think she must have known something has happened in the, out there in the forest because for once Tova Alexanderson is not coming into a leading position here. She was a final starter. She is going to come home with a medal though today. It won't be the colour she wanted and it was third place then for Tova Alexanderson. There was there must have been a mistake here, about a two-minute mistake, if not more than two-minute mistake, maybe three-minute mistake in this very final section. We haven't seen it because of the GPS. We'll hopefully get some sort of indication. But for me as well, it shows at the World Champs, I feel Tove Alexanderson would have been able to make a mistake like that and still win. So mm -hmm. she just doesn't seem, maybe there's, we know she had coronavirus quite soon after the World Championships and maybe that is how it's impacted her physically because it is not the win today from Tova Alexanderson she is used to taking that win she just wanted mm -hmm. I think to get away from everybody here I think it's kind of a, a mix of what you mentioned before for sure she knows that she uh, I mean she has not been training very well during the last weeks uh, we know that she has been in good training for one and a half weeks now which mm -hmm isn't what she's used to and then you you get this effect that you're aware of the situation that you're not on top um, that has a, an effect on your orienteering as well you can't like be as aggressive as she was before because she knows that she doesn't have this margins anymore compared to the others at the world champs she knew that she could do two or three minutes mistake and still win today she wasn't sure about that anymore and this makes of course the, or the orienteering part itself also more difficult and then you get this kind of chain effect and it gets more and more difficult and maybe she was in the end when she heard that it was quite tight at the arena passage maybe it was she was just pushing too hard here in the end mm -hmm. thinking that she's not allowed to do a mistake at all and then uh, yeah doing a mistake but of course it, it would be so <laughs> so interesting to see what she has done to have her here in this GPS an analysis but uh, I'm sure we will hear some voices of her at one point and uh, yeah. latest <laughs> tonight know <laughs> what happened yeah absolutely well we may be able to hear or we maybe it depends how the gps is malfunctioned i know sometimes you can kind of plug it in and then get all the data off from it once you've finished the race so we'll hope we can see that um i actually think maybe benjaminson's route choice into 19 i didn't really lose i think she was behind abasold anywhere i don't think it, that really made a difference on no. on the position um, there but um, it, yeah. It's quite, uh, I mean, it's a lot of up and down there. It's quite, um, it's many details on the map and she kind of avoids to get right through and could get it a bit more th smooth when she was uh, running more to the right there. And I think in the end, the end, uh, if we look at the splits, it seems that it was about the same to go straight there or a bit around. Waiting at the finish then for Lena Strand. She'll be about 15 minutes behind. Again, losing some more time. We saw her make the mistake at control number 14. There are a few others um, around the course as well. I think not really big misses, but some in terms of distance. But I think it's kind of costly running around in, in a few places. But Lena Strand's, uh, I think it certainly has a better direction coming uh, to this last control compared to some of the others we've seen and she'll be looking for a top 15 spot here 
So to make the top 15, you can still be 15 minutes behind. And I think really those the top the top runners, is specifically the top four, because then there's still a five-minute gap down back to Emma Biesmo. Those, those women really were a class apart from the rest today. Mm, that's true. We, uh, that's kind of the... We, actually, we have seen that already after like four controls. You could really see... Uh, <laughs> who was able to to get away a bit we had Hannah Lund but with this very smart route choice to the second control but then we had only three runners that were able to keep the gap quite uh, low compared to Hannah Lund but and these are the three runners in the top here yeah, someone we hadn't talked about in that top 10, Victoria Heistad Bjornstad, who's one of the young Norwegians, I think mostly been known as a sprinter, as, as you said already, Jonas, like that's a big part of how some of the juniors uh, break into the senior team. They do more sprinting, but that top 10 here in the World Cup, that's, that's really impressive um, for her. Anybody else you want to pick out as we go down the list? Uh, let me take a look. I, I mean, it's very obvious that we have quite many strong runners from Finland they're on position let's see eight nine and eleven that's quite good um, also if you look at the results there are many I mean almost everyone is from Switzerland Norway Sweden or Finland here in the top let's see it's top 14 um, yeah it's no bigger surprises actually yeah except for Hannah Lundberg uh, but we were talking about her a lot. It's very impressive how she, as a junior, can perform here at such a, li a high level uh, in a long distance, especially. Um, but otherwise, it's it's not the race of the uh, of many su bigger surprises here. It was a very difficult race technically and physically, and uh, yeah, that's usually leading to favorites to win. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, I guess Hannah Lundberg, you, you go. She's she's not normally used to running that 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 far, and actually, that's um, when maybe in the pandemic you go. Okay, fine. I'm just going to go train for longer. This my junior season is going to be uh, interrupted. Let's just let's just go for it, and let's just uh, kind of prepare for <laughs> the longer distances there. That was Harry and I, the director, just making faces at the camera. I love that. And, and some really great kind of pictures from, I mean, what is a gorgeous day out in the forest. And and Emma Biesmo was, was quite a long way um, up there uh, in, the, in the top 10. And we heard something from her that she is about, about just really kind of enjoying... Mm. just the, the the style of the terrain but also it being technical as well mm, that was actually uh maybe that was kind of a surprise as well that she, she was up there but only because she ha didn't really uh, manage to have this good performance on this uh international level she has done many good races in sweden and you got really the feeling that uh that she is very close to take the next step but then she didn't really uh manage to to show that at the world championships and now she today she had a good run even though she had some smaller problems as she said in the in the interview but then she could always uh, react uh, quite fast quite quickly and uh, save it anyway thank you very much are you surprised you have beaten all the swedes <laughs> especially to Sanderson here on their home soil yes i'm really surprised um we were choking before the race <laughs> that this is the day and moments to beat Tuve um, in her home terrain. <laughs> and uh, for me, it was just a joke, but it's not reality. And I'm really surprised and happy about it. But you must be happy also with your race today. It's a tough race. Yes, of course. It was tough uh, mentally, physically and technically for, from the beginning to the end. You had to be focused all the time. And uh, yeah, for me, it went really well. I could execute my plan um, and yeah, I just enjoyed it. It was nice. And also World Cup win here in Sweden <laughs> must be big for you, Simona. Yes, really big. And uh, yeah, at the moment I can't really believe it yet. <laughs> but um, yeah, it's really nice to win the World Cup in such a nice terrain and especially Swedish terrain. Congratulations. Thank you. Well, it's Simone Abbasod's first individual World Cup win. And yeah, what a place to do it in this fantastic terrain. 
beating the Swedes on the home soil where they have been so dominant. Uh, I think, you know, it was this this kind of win has been coming for a long while for her. We always thought she was maybe always going to be the one to be able to beat Alexanderson and kind of end that dominance from the Swede. And she she's achieved it in, in great style here today. Not again, Maybe nobody really has had a completely clean race today, but uh, she has certainly... Uh, worked hard and been well rewarded with her first ever individual World Cup win. We will now, though, move on to the men's race. As you can see, looking through some of the statistics here, we get our estimated winning time 100 minutes, though if it goes anything like the women's race, it will be a little bit longer than that. And uh, let's have a deep dive. We've already had lots of men out on this course already, lots of men finishing too, but Jonas, talk us through all the details. Mm. It is the same start as we have seen in the women's race and hopefully uh, we will now see a bit more of the GPS towards control too because it was decisive in the women's race. Um, three, four, five similar to the, men, uh, to the women's race also TV control at control number five then. A bit a longer loop here, six, seven, eight, nine, a long leg to control nine and then into this tricky area. Uh, 10, 11 there and down uh, to control 14. Then we have the same route choice again here where you have seen a uh, few runners going down to the road around there and uh, the fastest was straight. So I guess it will also be the fastest here in the women's race. Then up map change at control 16 and also exactly the same route here to control 17. The long leg 200 meters climbing into the Bermuda Triangle where we have a slightly different course there 18, 19, 20. Uh, we have seen that they were heading into different directions and then an additional loop here in quite tricky area uh, control 21 is difficult and the course planner said one of the most difficult controls actually control 6 which doesn't look too difficult if you just take a look at the map but the visibility is low and you don't have many features to navigate with which, make, which makes it very difficult to approach control 6. Uh, let's see if, if he is right. He was quite right with uh, everything else especially, <laughs> except for the winning time so uh, <laughs> it will be interesting to follow that. Yes, it will be really interesting to follow that. Again, quite a lot of the characteristics we've seen from the women's course that extra bit of distance to kind of get our get our winning time up create a real real challenge in the terrain so that is what the, the overall look again they have a map change though at the um, arena passage before they climb 200 meters uh, up towards control uh, number 17 that's over a third of the climb the course in um, in that leg so really really tricky let's have another look at can see that the whole map is on this slope and we're going to have a little more of a, a deeper dive into some of the route choice options here mm. we've got this remote start um. this very short number one and then again this control to number two is going to be interesting I mean, we have seen that it was faster to go the blue option in the women's race, but uh, maybe it, the difference is not as big here in the men's race. Uh, we know that the gap was around, let's say, 45-50 seconds if you had a good race there to the second control. Um, it will be a new situation here, but I still think that it is a good option to go to, uh, to choose the blue option there. Yeah, this this picture gives us a sense of the, the visibility, the the undergrowth, bilberries there, pretty good. I mean, this map is pretty much white, brown, blue, and black. There is mm. hardly any green on there. There is hardly any yellow on there at all, and um, it is a pretty dreamy area pretty good to to run through just nice kind of orienting and a good contrast to some of the long distances we've seen especially at the world champs which have been very green and very tough and low visibility and this just mm. really tests you on a kind of different style of orienting but there's still yeah, but areas which have lower visibility as well yeah the, the lack of colors makes it actually quite tricky because um i mean the coloring with this uh, with the vegetation is it's only uh, 
showing you how fast it's how much it slows you down so it, there's nothing it doesn't say anything about the visibility and here you have actually uh, parts where the visibility is quite low but you don't really see it on the map because it doesn't slow you down so you have changes in vegetation and kind of boundaries but the boundaries are not distinct enough to have it as a vegetation boundary on the map so it makes it impossible to see on the map where the visibility changes and this leads to that you have to be either very well prepared and know in which part of the map the visibility is good or bad which is almost impossible or then you have to adapt very quickly when you're there and be ready to slow down and uh, change your orienteering style your tactic your tactics a bit and adapt to the terrain and here you see for example a very dense area where it's hard to yeah to to see and kind of differ out the, the, the different hills and everything in the in the terrain so you have to be very careful in this part and then you get out again and um and you have exactly also a wide area as this one uh, but which slow, uh, which is just open, and you see 200 meters. Yeah, exactly. You've really got to adapt and be flexible, and that is why this course is tricky. You've got to you've got to change your entering style, and this comes after towards the end of the course when you've just climbed 200 meters. That you've got to read a lot of the really small detail on the map. You work with a, a magnifier that's going to come in, probably quite useful at this particular point. You've got to change it. You might see a few people around. You've got the cameras around as well. And it just kind of all those little things add up to make this particular part of the course really, really difficult. And then again, you're going down a hill. The, the nature of the course changes again as you head down into that control number 21, as you were mentioning, and you're towards the end. You can kind of feel that you're really, really near the finish and the, the characteristics of the map change again. And so generally we have the slightly more runnable, slightly, I say runnable, it's all runnable, the better visibility towards the bottom of this hill towards the lake and generally the, the lower visibility towards the top, but it's all it's mm -hmm. all a nature reserve. It's there's not really any plantations or anything, so it's pretty wild uh, and good. You know, it's, it's very. It's not very obvious where the the visibility changes. It's not worth marking it on the map, basically. So um, yeah, we have our start list here, and um, as with the women's race, it is in kind of reverse order of the World Cup standings. So as we flick through this, we have loads of runners entered here. We've got 117 on the start list, but who are we really looking out for, Jonas? Well, we are really looking out for the world champion, Kasper Foster. He has shown such a good race where he caught Magne Daly and Matthias Kiburts at the world championships long distance. And they actually both got a medal when they came to the finish together, uh, all, of, all three of them. Uh, but also then Kiburts, Magne Daly, of course, they won medals there, even though they, are, they were in this group. Uh, Daniel Hopman, who was very unlucky there, ended up in fourth position um, Emil Svensk one of the names I would like to name and also uh, Ruslan Glibov he didn't run the long distance but he was very strong in the middle distance at the world championships so it will be interesting to see uh, how good he can perform today yeah, I think those are all good names to highlight, but we do have some absences, in particular previous four times um, world champion at the long, he was his run was ended by this man, by Casper uh, Fosser, but there's no Olaf Lindeners today. We know he was um, not in the best of shape, struggling with some injuries at the World Championships, but uh, is, has not made the start line here today. Here, as you were mentioning, Ruslan Glibov from Ukraine, and uh, they had a really yeah, great middle distance and the relay as well for the Ukrainian team too. So good one to watch out for. Uh, we can see a lot of the, these ones, uh, these last starters, just kind of having a replay of them at the start. This is Magna Daly, as you said, Jonas, he got that uh, bronze medal at the World Champs long distance, being part of that train with Matthias Kibbertz and um, Kasper Foster. And we haven't really seen that many, many trains in the women's race. Um, 
even with two kind of running together, but not many. So uh, this is Daniel Hoodman here, third to last starter. Really unfortunate maybe to uh, to miss out on that medal. He was in that fourth place. Another person who didn't really have, uh, had a bit of an unlucky time in the long distance was Gustav Bergman. He um, pulled out. He's had uh, kind of ongoing back injuries for a good number of years now and that just really failed him on the last day of the long distance and he ended up being quite emotional at the finishing saying he, he wished some of his other teammates had run instead of him because he wasn't in the best shape. And our final starter today, Matthias Kibbutz from Switzerland, the long distance silver medalist, taking I think that was his first uh, long distance medal. So he had a really good... Uh, good uh, World Championships over in the Czech Republic and will be, I'm sure, full of confidence, although not quite the way he would have wanted to, not the ideal way to win a medal, but still a medal is a medal and um, great results from him. But we are now back in the forest for, I think, looking for our split number one. You can just see the kind of banners in there, the little advertising gives it a little Gives it away a little bit for my liking because you can really see those in the distance. Um, but Daniel Hoodman here is going to be about a couple of minutes behind. And I think, yes, I think we've got Casper Fosser here leading at this part of the course. And um, I can say that our leader at the finish is our shock sprint world champion, Isaac von Krusenfuerna, who's actually still at second fastest at this first TV spot. He was mm -hmm. one minute and 14 seconds slower than Kasper Fosser, but quicker than all those others who have um, made it through there. He's our current leader at the finish. His time at mm -hmm. 107.55. And uh, here, not totally unexpected, we see, I mean, we have seen almost everyone in the women's ra race going straight there. Uh, and for me, it's not, I mean, it's not a big surprise that if we see that in the women's race, that we will also see it in the men's race. Um, <laughs> we see a runner who is kind of out for revenge here, Gustav Ferryman. Of course, I missed him when I, we were talking about the favorites, but he is always very strong in Swedish terrain. So he is definitely a runner we have to uh, take into this group uh, with the favorites there. And he's on his way to the first... TV split. He was 16 seconds behind at control number three. Compared to Casper Fosser, I, I don't think we have seen him in the GPS comparison, so he was a bit faster there. Um, but the one, the second fastest time after, yeah, see here. Yeah, that's pretty good. and Van Cruz and Kwana, yeah. So very, very fast start again by Casper Foster. <laughs> that's, I mean, that's something. It's, it's kind of uh, history it's is kind coming of back. We've seen, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Because he was starting really fast, uh, 2019, when we for the first time saw him competing in the senior level on the World Championship competition, long distance. Uh, he was very long, for a long time he was in the lead there and then passed in the end uh, by Olav Lundenes and it was the same in the Czech Republic a month ago when he caught uh, first Matthias Kiburz and then Magne Daly very early in the race and now it's happening again. See here Kiburz lost about uh, one and a half minutes here already yep. at the beginning. Yeah, I think that looks about right, and that'll push him behind the current leader at the finish's time. Yeah, and now, actually, Kibitz has got to be careful because yeah. he's he's not got his direction here. But he he's should run see down, the He's headed there. to the path and run down the path, and then you've got to, uh, you know, make sure you're keeping on your direction while using that kind of path corner as an attack point to to get down the hill. And yeah. Hmm. Could see the marsh there, it saved his control taking, but he lost quite a lot of time here in the beginning already. And we also got the GPS of Kasper Fosser here. It's a good start by Fosser and 
Gustav Berryman. Yeah, though my thoughts that Berryman was a bit closer and now will drop behind. Let's see if we can hear from Isak, our current leader. Helt okej okay ändå, men jag bor ganska mycket i två kontroller i rad i början och sen så ja, lite seg fysiskt i början. Men sen kom jag igång mitt på och tyckte jag kunde flytta på bra. Men sen efter varningen var det mycket sten och tyckte jag fotledarna var lite trötta så jag svårt att trycka på. Men jag höll ihop det ganska bra i slutet ändå så ja, jag fann det var helt okej okay nöjd. Var det som du och ni hade förväntat er? Ja, men det var det faktiskt. Det var... Vi väntade oss uppe i detaljerika i början, men ja, vi gick ju bara lång sträcka bort på en gång och sen, sen lite lättare i mitt på och sen ja, uppevända i slut i detaljerika. Då. Men ja, ja nöjd att hålla upp till slut i alla fall, men jag grämmer lite av de två misstagen ja, i början. Då. Sett på tiderna så har du varit stark på slut. Har du känt dig stark också att orka orkat hela vägen? Nej, det var fruktansvärt jobbigt i slutet så jag tror om det kommer några starka i slutet så kan de dra ifrån rejält tror jag. Så, ja. Det kommer nog gå snabbare i slutet. Men avslutningsvis, VM-guldet i Tjeckien, vad har det betytt för dig Isak självförtroendemässigt? Ja, men jättemycket. Det är skönt att ha det med sig liksom, hela karriären framöver. Så, oavsett hur det går nu så kan man ändå se tillbaka på det och vara nöjd med, med vad man har åstadkommit. Så det, det är skönt att ha med i bagaget. Tack. Tack. Ja, yeah, interesting. Uh, he mentioned that he did quite uh, many mistakes or he had some problems in the beginning. Uh, and he also felt kind of tired in the beginning, but this uh, disappeared then. He, he got the motor going halfway through and then got into the race a bit better. Uh, he also mentioned the same as we have heard earlier that uh, by Emma Biesmu that it was quite as expected. Maybe that they didn't expect that they will uh, kind of jump over this tricky part in the beginning and then come back to it uh, later, but otherwise it was um quite as expected and he said that it's very very tough in the end and that he thinks that stronger runners will be able to push away from him quite much in uh towards the end of the race and then in the very end of the interview he mentioned something very interesting that uh, he was asked what the title the world championship title means to him and he said that uh, of course it is good for his self-confidence that it is something that he will have uh, with him for the rest of the career and it kind of whatever happens now uh, no one can take it away from him and it's mm -hmm. kind of a uh, yeah it's kind of a pressure that is going away so yes everything that's coming now it's kind of a bonus well yes i mean you could you could take that world title as as being more pressure as being Right, I've got to maintain that level. People now have expectations of me. Maybe, maybe he thinks that a little bit, but certainly no, what he's it's... saying is that I've got that. Anything else? Anything else is a bonus. Like you know, to have a, to have achieved a world title as a such a young <laughs> runner, that's amazing. You know, it's just about uh, playing your cards, right? You can see it either in a critical yeah. way and say now yeah. the, the expectations are higher, or you can say no. I have I have this with me. No one can take it away from me, and uh, so everything that's coming is bonus. And I think it's very smart of him to see it this way. Um, mm -hmm. To take it as a, it's just yeah. I mean, it's up to you how you look at things. I think you've and got to really take the pressure off, especially as a young orienteer. You know that there's a lot of other more experienced guys there, and you've got to, you know, orienteering is a sport where anything can happen, and you can get you can make big mistakes or you can you, you know a lot of things are out of your control as well with how everybody else is performing around you even if you put together a really good run then someone else can can have a better one in the day and you've just got to mm. take your chances when you can oh here's and a mistake here. one of the ones he was talking about yeah, maybe because exactly. that's quite a big miss to seven he said that he had two of them and that he is really yeah that it is a big pity for him that he did two big mistakes because uh Otherwise, it would have been a good race, uh, except for the fact that he felt quite tired. But my guess is that everyone will feel tired uh, towards the end. So I think this is just something that you as a runner kind of have to accept and try to fight through. 
Yeah, it's called the long distance for a reason because it is long and it makes you feel tired and makes you feel rubbish and all things like that. And the task is to to do the best you can over that really long distance. As you see, Jon Elkus Osman in here. Looks like he's going to take the second fastest time here. We can see there again the time of Von Cruz and Fuerna, who we just heard from, and the closest so far is Osman from Norway. So we'll go just at 30 seconds down. So pretty good there. We've seen from the GPS tracking with the likes of Florian Hovald uh, overtaking Von Cruz and Fuerna as well. We've got uh, Konstantin Severinitsky here from Russia into the finish. He was caught up by Osman as well. And he though, will go into third place. Pretty good result at this point for the Russian, but we haven't we haven't really seen the impact, you know, of Isaac von Krusenfreiner's mistake. So I think uh, he he se seems to think there are a lot. We'll really keep an eye on that. We've already seen that kind of one of those misses. Mm. What was it? To number seven. So because sometimes it's I think it's hard as a runner to get a get a sense of how. Yeah, but how big those I mean, mistakes this, were? We'll see. This was quite a big mistake he did there. It was about, uh, let's say, three minutes. And um, if he's talking about two quite big mistakes, let's say that he missed five minutes. His time is 108, uh, 108 minutes. Uh, we have an expected winning time of 100 minutes. So then it's uh, it was a good race beside of that. And I think he's quite aware of the fact that it would have been very good if he would not have missed those two controls. It will be interesting to see which one uh, the other control was that he had problems with. Maybe yeah, you see it here. An eye out, maybe we will see it now. Yeah, and some problems there. Ah, mm -hmm. This is just, he should, when he gets out to the path there, he should like keep on going a bit to be sure where he is when he leaves the path again. Now he just use the path to be sure that he he's too much to the east and then went back again but he didn't think about the fact that he could be too early looking for the control as well that's for sure a small mistake there yeah definitely a small one there looking pretty good for florian hovald who are live with the uh, swiss runner Mm, he was two minutes and seven seconds behind at the first TV control, compared to Casper Fosser, of course. And we will try and follow him down here towards control number 14. This is our second TV split, and he looks to be running pretty good. Yeah, we can have a look at the splits there. So mm, there you can time. see the. The effect of uh, Van Cruz and Cuerna's mistake, uh, he was uh, two and a half minutes behind that uh, second TV control, uh, or that you could see the times really shifted, it was about one and a half mm -hmm. minutes, he, l he must have lost there at control seven, Van Cruz and Cuerna, compared to Florian Hovald at least. Yeah, but Timo Sild our current leader at that point, the Estonian with 50, it's under 54 minutes of running. But I hope I'll, yeah, looking pretty good there. And we're back up here at this Bermuda Triangle section, and that looks like Ralph Street. Just stepping through on this rocky part and this, remember they've climbed up 200 meters to get to this point. This is the trickiest part of the course, in my opinion. He looks reasonably solid there. It's going to be about five minutes off the pace at this point. Elias Kuka then here, who has actually caught or will have, no, is on his way maybe to catching uh, Ralph Street. Mm -hmm. This control is the same, 
as we have seen before and then they will head to another control so they will have slightly different direction out of control 18 here a bit more to the left Yeah, Finn's going well. Fourth place in the relay at the World Champs, twelfth in the long distance. Mm, and you can really, you really get the feeling that there's something growing in Finland again. They are, get mm. better and better results. They have a very good consistency in the relay running. Will definitely be a team for. Uh, we will see. Uh, we have to. We will have to have on the list uh, as the f one of the favorites and. Maybe not for the victory, but for a very good position on Sunday as well. And here we have a route choice. And uh, that's something the course planner mentioned as well, that it is very fast up there where we have Emil Svensk. So it is, uh, once you're up there, it's a very nice entrance to the control and it's very fast. And there we Another also have the effect. Another mistake from Frenner as, oh, yeah, as well. Yeah, oh, no, that's the one, one we've already seen. Yeah. Right. But you can see that you have two options there. If you go straight, then uh, you have this up and down all the way. You have to fight. You have to kind of change your running style all the way. Or then you go around the hill and you get on this plateau and with open, uh, kind of semi-open area where you can push very hard. Yeah, the, the core setters for us have, have, have rated the different route choice options in terms of runnability, difficulty and, and time. And for that 8-9, to nine, the route that we saw Emil's friends take, they've said it is green for good on runnability, difficulty and time. So they've said that one is a really good option. We could see that well executed there by Emma Svensk. As William Lind comes in here to get third place currently. So within a minute of the leader at the moment. But we've got quite a few who've gone faster than Isaac from Cruising for and we've seen the mistakes that he's made. So very soon, I'm sure he'll be toppled off mm. the top spot. Maybe Emil Spence will do it. He's had a really good um, season so far, fantastic yep. season so far, in fact, and uh, very probably the best of his career and looking very good here. Very interesting in the long distance uh, at the World Championships. He actually had an abysmal start into the race. He kind of uh, chose, chose the wrong route to every control in the beginning. And then from about one third of the competition, he was actually the fastest runner into the finish. So uh, he, he turned uh, that race completely. I think he was around uh, somewhere around uh, tw 22nd position. He <laughs> could really hear, hear some some not so nice words as well but he really turned that race from really bad to actually quite good because he ended up in fifth position there not far behind the medals yeah and it's impressive to be able to turn around a race like that kind of mentally when you know things haven't been going quite so well or or well maybe you don't when it's big route twists because you don't know that things have been going quite so well but you've still got that mental Mm. Discipline and everything but to push yourself around that the last part of the race really impressive. Yeah, him. but the thing is that he, he was really aware of the fact that he, it wasn't a good race in the beginning. He mentioned in the interview that he was ashamed of his first part of the competition and that he really had to try to refocus after that part and try to make the best of the rest. And uh, I mean, yeah, it was good. You could see it. Yeah, it was good. And it shows, I think he's really... Had a had a great season this this year, and it looks like it's just continuing at the moment. But Emil Svensk, there's still like ten runners after him, just less than ten runners after him. So lots more fast names, including of course Casper Fossa, uh, still to go through that second checkpoint. Let's have a look now at this route then up towards control number 17. Mm -hmm. From Chris and Koena going into this uh, up and down kind of terrain there. Uh, and we should say this is race. Martin Hoodman it's being uh, compared to, number 301. Yeah. In the women's race we have seen that many of the runners decided to go a bit to the right of the red line. Here we have them staying to the left. Or on the red line from Chris and Koena rounding this hill there bit off direction but uh, fortunately he actually hits one of the more 
distinct features up <laughs> there and could kind of uh, save up the situation there. I mean, it's much easier if you get more to the left of the control compared to if you come more to the right because uh, right on the right side of the control it's much more detailed and you have so ma everything looks the same but on the left it's a bit more specific and you could see that Hoopman really Martin Hoopman really had this great direction into the control my gosh his direction was so solid into that control that's exactly the kind of execution you need and actually if you look down at the splits there you see you can see he's lost a lot of time when you get to control number three and then number five but then they're looking kind of similar to the leading leading uh, athletes who've already passed by those controls there he's not really lost too much time so that's it's, it's not too bad is it who is it compared to is it compared to the is it it's in compared the beginning to the quickest compared to Foss, uh, uh, yeah so then that might be the reason why he's so much behind yeah. in the beginning Yeah, I think it always compares it to the leader um, on that, that split. Control, yeah. At that particular control, yeah. But definitely you can see here that from control 16 to 18, he was fast. He was really fast. Here, and that's uh, of course the result of his great direction there. That's the control where we've seen uh, Imesvensk going to the north, around the hill there. See that the, the three runners we have in the picture here, they choose to go a bit more uh, to the south. And what yeah, a great speed here again. <laughs> And great, I was just going to say, great speed through to control number nine and really just no fear running down this slope here into the 14th control because you can see there the, mi the gap at the moment, two minutes, 44. Of course, we've got, we still have yet Matthias Kibbert's kind of pass through those controls, but he goes two minutes, 51 seconds quicker than Timo Sills, quickly taking on some liquids and straight out again onto the next control and I've got to say Casper Fossa looking very good here. Mm, and of course we he's kind of the first one of the big favorites starting so it's not a big surprise that he has a, a gap there. It's a bigger surprise that the gap at the first TV control already was uh, 40 seconds and more. But of course, I mean, you should be, uh, we shouldn't talk about the surprise at all. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> no, he's the world champion and he is... Exactly. Uh, yeah. We could talk about him being a surprise two years ago in 2019. And now, yeah. no longer. He is no longer a surprise. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be a surprise if he doesn't do well. Now we can say. Mm. Will be... I mean, now... Uh, we, we were mentioning the fact about the trains at the World Championships before and uh, one of the good things today is that we don't have uh, uh, to start as one of the last runners really. So uh, I mean the, the really bad thing last time was that maybe two of the fastest runners or two of the big favorites were just starting in front of him. But today mm -hmm. we have most of the big favorites starting after him. Uh, so I don't think it will train up as much as it did at the World Championships, uh, fortunately. And then also, it's kind of different terrain here. Um, sometimes when you have one runner that is so much stronger than an everyone else, as we, I mean, he he was so much stronger at the World Championships. Otherwise, he wouldn't uh, win with I've three and six that minutes. Much time, yeah. Yeah, and and then you have that. Here you have this areas where it is very dense and visibility is low so the the risk that you lose the runner in front of you is kind of higher in this kind of terrain compared to when you really have this route choice race and you have uh, a very distinct kind of route you will run and everyone knows where to go and you can more or less follow once you have decided uh, your route choice but here it's all about micro route choices and you have to be very careful so you take a big risk in a dense area where you when you're just following the runner in front of you and kind of 
lose one or two or three or four or five meters and get him out of sight because if you get out there again and you don't know where you are then you're lost so Alvin Reader felt safely into control uh, number 18 not quite I think as as clean a direction into 17 just from the way he was approaching that control but um let's have a look though at Isaac von Krusenfwena and Timo Sild who has been setting some some actually some really quick times mm -hmm. there and what we haven't seen is did we, did we see von Krusenfwena go down to the bottom here to go to number yeah. two I would have liked him I, I would have liked him to go straight out to the path <laughs> here it, it feels that he did some something in between which was okay but you could really take a bigger advantage of of the yeah i mean you could take a big advantage of the path there maybe read something uh, that's coming later on in the race uh, get some help with direction you could push a bit harder there even so if you go around then you should do it like really consequently There we have one mistake at control six and then the second one at seven. I, maybe those were the two ones he was talking about. We know also that he did another small second mistake nine. at control nine. Yeah. And you can see he's got that, that higher speed compared to the Estonian, but those mistakes just adding up really here. Here's Emil Svensk then through this map exchange through the arena and has he dropped down some time it's 113 behind Hovald. i think it was quite good he was yeah yeah it was 142 before now it's one and ten so it is quite good there actually yeah, pretty good. Let's resume looking at this GPS tracking because I think we're about to see Timo Sill through at one of our splits with and we know he's posted some good times earlier. He's going to be the next one to go super quick. Mm, very good here with I the direction. And von Krusenfren, I think, just trying to play it a bit more safe there going by the open area by the buildings. Interesting, both of them choosing to go down to the roads. Waiting also for Joey Hardorn very soon into the arena and the map change for Joey. 63 minutes running right now, 63.32. Let's see here now. He will not be that time, but Joey on his way down to the arena and Splitting the map Splitting up a bit, kind of different approaches here uh, Silt avoiding this up and avoiding this up and down here uh, but getting back to a good direction looks good so far and now we are live with him Timo Silt yeah so we'll soon see him at control 17 but for me he looked really slow going up through some of that kind of rocky uh, section um, up that hill there in in comparison to von Krusenfwena that s the Swede was just able to catch a lot of distance up on him there but he does look like he's got good direction so uh, playing it kind of safe and kind of trying to not lose too much energy there so you can see Timo Sild was the quickest then through this uh, arena passage Hadorn's not going to be as quite as quick it's going to go close to the time of teammate Florian Hovald so Timo Sild who we'll soon see at the top of the hill was leading coming through the arena passage at this point Hadorn is currently into third and he will really hear the sound of Per Forsberg there saying he's 40 seconds behind at the moment there's lots of quick guys still to come in the field but Joey Hadorn there it's already won one World Cup race and let's see what we can do in this one as well 
We haven't really seen much of Magna Daly yet. So let's see what he does yeah. here. He's very close to the red line there. Not really afraid of the climbing of the up and down. Looks good to control nine also. Small, small mistake to ten. Good direction here so far to control 12. Getting the hill there. Very nice. Yep. So very good also, here in this yeah. section of the race. Here we have him in the picture. Yep, here he is in the picture then. Coming down the hill towards control number 14. And yeah, looked really precise there. Really great direction. Uh, and rewarded with a quick time. This is Adon Heimdall into the finish. This is going to be just slower than Von Cruz and Fuana, but they're going to go into second position here. Looks good alongside the Latvian Rudolf Cernis, who he's caught up a lot of times. So Adon Heimdall will go into second place in just 10 seconds down there. So good finish there from the uh, Norwegian, who also does quite a lot of ski orienteering as well. It's a great ski orienteer as well as for orienteer. This is Timo Sild then. That is control number 17. He's mm, caught up Gunnar Imsein as well, the exactly. three minutes. And this could well be one on for one of his best runs, Timo Sild. He's uh, he was 11th place at the middle distance champ middle distance world championships. He's got two 10th places at the world champs long distance, um, but seems to be you know without without results in the Czech Republic, kind of back on uh, top form. But mm. is he going to go better here today? Looks pretty good. I mean, you mentioned this before. Uh, maybe not the speed to be in the top three or top five but he does a very good race technically today and uh, we had big gaps in the women's race so maybe that's a good uh, way of uh, doing your orienteering today not taking too big risks but be sure with your or orienteering and so far it's paying off So here we have Hoopman. This is Daniel Hoopman this time. Yeah, and also we have uh, Gustav Berryman here. So let's see. Seems that von Cruz and Kjerna is better speed here compared to Hoopman. Hoopman also losing some time here compared to Berryman. Looks good for the Swedish runner in this section of the race. Oh, and I think Berryman and Hubman are running together because yeah. the tail's three minutes, the gap was that's three minutes, so these two are running together, I think. You can see yeah, them going the same route like. into number nine. Yeah. So here, here we is have Gustav Berryman. <laughs> so where do we have Daniel Hubman? I think it looked like Gustav Berryman yeah. was running away Good. a little bit there exactly. from, the, uh, from the Swiss. I got the same good. feeling there in the downhill. Yeah. And uh, yeah, this the lo actually looks is good. good. Mm. He is 10 seconds behind uh, in front at control 12. It looks that he's as if it's still in front here. It's might still be 10 seconds, 11 seconds even. 11 seconds. <laughs> And yeah, he's gone ahead then of Casper Foss. I'm not sure we saw Casper Foss through this point, but for me, those those two here, really big ones to watch. We didn't know see Matthias Kubert's GPS though, on uh, on that GPS we just saw there. There's Daniel Hubman, and this is if he's not being able to stay on, he's got to really work hard now to try and stay on the back of Gustav Bergman. But I, for me, he's struggling to do that, and mm. he's just kind of going to get dropped by the Swede, I think. Mm. Although with visibility this good, you can see, we can see um, <laughs> Gustav Bowman uh, ahead there. So really, at this point, all Daniel Hubman's got to do is kind of 
got to try and lock eyes on the Swede and try and make back some of that ground whilst you've got this good visibility, though. So standings then at split number two. We have yet to see Matthias Kubertz, though, through this point. Gustav Bergman just those 11 seconds ahead of Kasper Fosser. Those two are out and out quicker than everybody else currently. Timo Sill, though, three minutes behind. He is just going through this Bermuda Triangle area. We'll see him soon at the finish. He's leading uh, where he is at the currently, so we'll see. But there's a lot of other runners and riders around the same time as him, though. So, and we know he wasn't the quickest, I think, going up that hill to number 17. So we um, will see where that leaves him. Catherine, when you're talking about, we will see Timo Sil soon in the finish. We're talking about like 35 minutes. Okay. Uh, so because we have a bit a longer loop. There for the, for the <laughs> we men's do. Race. You're right. They do have a longer loop then for. Um, but I mean, for the men's compared to the women's. But I'm thinking in context hey, of this race. I mean, we'll will. Yeah. Hey, it's it's a long distance. <laughs> it's a long afternoon for us. So uh, it's yep. a short time. In, uh, 35 minutes. <laughs> exactly. In the whole context of this of this afternoon, 35 minutes is, is nothing so anyway we will pay close attention then we're looking at comparison Florian Hovald and Von Krusenfren and the reason Von Krusenfren are still our leader at the finish which is why we're kind of comparing a lot of the times through to him and I think we'll see Hovald very soon through our arena passage I think or even actually at the top of the hill by the really technical area. It's interesting to see almost everyone in the men's race heading down towards this street here and then up again. Uh, I actually expected them to go straight here. Well, I think it shows that, that I mean, it's like, I guess it's like the um, one to two there is a path going so close in the mm. going in the same direction as as the way you want to go. Yeah, of even course. if you just have to step out to it, then it, it's too tempting. And especially as it's a road as well, it's not just a path; it's a road, easier to run along. And of course, uh, it's a long distance. So you get the chance to kind of, uh, of course, it sounds stupid, but to kind of recover there. Maybe not your body, but at least your head. You can kind of. Uh, turn it off for like let's say 40 50 seconds and then you really change back and yeah sometimes it's very good to just get a period where you don't have to keep the focus all the way down bef especially before you go into this section here and i'm quite sure that many of the runners uh, expect it to go up here again even if they don't see it on the map because they have to, will change it just after the arena passage but i'm quite sure that they ex everyone knows we are going to run in this kind of in this part of the map here uh, later <laughs> yeah. on in the race to, to use this map and then not put you through that technical <laughs> part would be just a travesty that would just be a, such of a shame for this area in this map that to not go there so thankfully it's all fine but we've seen Florian Hobart in this GPS tracking he was a lot it was a little bit to the right of the line looked like heading between 17 and 18 and dropping a bit of time, you can see he's just trying to look around. Mm. He thinks it's to his right. He's looking and around a lot. He knows that there's the camera is there. Yeah, exactly. It's the classic camera trap there. You see the camera and you really hope that uh, the camera can catch the control from there. But this one is actually on the way between the two controls. So it, you don't really see the control from that position. Yeah, instead it just catches you making a mistake. And someone mm, else who exactly. must have made a mistake in the terrain, Matthias Kubertz, because he's approaching two minutes slower than Gustav Bergman and Kasper Fosser, those two who are out and out in the lead at the moment. He still looks to be in third place. And, you know, maybe all that time was kind of lost uh, towards control number three. Uh, probably control number two, to be honest, but he is into a solid third place there. But I s I'm surprised the gap is is a whole two minutes, to be honest, from first mm. to third. But you can see, I mean, if you... Uh, now it's okay here in this part, but when you saw him s running down the hill, it was not as attacking as Casper uh, Fosser, for example. Here he did a mistake, Fosser. At control six, quite a big one. That's the reason why we have uh, Gustav Bellerman in the lead. 
uh, at the Arena Passage, or at least just before, I think, just before the long leg towards the Arena Passage. Uh, but come back to Kibbutz, it just felt that he is not really, doesn't feel as comfortable in the terrain uh, running as the other two guys, Gustav Bergman and Kasper Fosser. But of course it's two minutes, there must have been a mistake as well, we've seen it to the third control where he got a bit uh, too high up in the slope there. Yeah, and the big surprise there, seeing it quite high up on that list with all of the athletes through, um, or at least the, the last athlete through number, split number two, control number 14, Timo Sills up there really high and we'll see his progress around the rest of the course to see whether he ends up quite as high at the end. Florian Hovald has now got both controls 17 and 18 and that's really tricky when you you know he was really close to the control just slightly off the line but i think unlike at, this is one where it looked like isaac von krusenfreunen was going to make a mistake and then actually because he was left of the line a similar amount to um the swiss runner and then but just took a really good line into the control and and actually did seem to be uh ha under control at that part of the race mika kumala mm -hmm. into 22nd and uh, how well he lost uh, around one and a half minute there. How many is this time? Compared to Timo Silt, it was only 39 seconds behind before. Now it's 2 minutes 37, so it's almost 2 minutes there. And also Emi Svensk with problems here. Losing Seeing his the camera. a bit there. It's again the camera trap. <laughs> But, but he, he, he seems, seems to be a bit more yeah, in control, exactly. doesn't he? Yeah, exactly. He knows, he, he knows about. Uh, I mean, sometimes you get a feeling he. It fe here, you could see that he, he wasn't sure about the direction. Then he saw the camera, and he knew in the kind of which direction he has to go now. That shows you that okay, I have a feeling I've been running too much to the right. If I'm not getting to the control, then I know I have to go to the left. So he kind of anticipated the mistake and you, if it, but wasn't hundred percent sure that he was wrong. So when he got up there, okay, now I have to go to the left. It's it's not here. Uh, so that was, of course, it is not it's not good, but it is not as uh, yeah as, as bad yeah, as he's, if he's you minimized no the time losses. Exactly. as much as he could there i think to be honest um obviously the ideal is is spiking the control 100 percent oh and i was gonna say he's not quite mm. on spot on here and then it, it it's kind of uh, surprising because he he knew from the control before that it's difficult and then he leaves the control and like after 50 meter he already starts to keep his head going from the left to the right, trying to get in all information he can. So it's kind of, he's not sure about uh, how fast, how far he has uh, gone at that point, or at least he he didn't see the attack point he wanted to see and was like really desperately trying to get it. But in the end, he, he found the control without uh, bigger time loss at least. Oh, and uh, Gustav Bergman is going through the run through here. Uh, D Daniel Huben is still just on his tail and he's just getting feedback from the coach here, getting maybe some liquids on and they'll be shouting at him. He's 28 seconds behind, so there must have been a 40 second time lost in there somewhere. I think he just gets a gel or something out of his trousers pocket and uh, exchanges the map. And this is where you want a gel before a climb like this, I think. Um, but yeah, there has definitely been a time loss in there for Gustav Bergman because he was 11 seconds ahead, now 28 behind. For me, I don't really understand why... I mean, he's still holding his uh, plastic mug uh, in his hand, his water, and his, he started to kind of open the gel at the moment when he got the map. Uh, I, I mean, he, in my opinion, he should do that before uh, he's even together with another runner. Uh, he, he must have seen the control before. There's even uh, some 
uh, plastic bands to in this arena passage you have to have it ready when you punch the controls at the, at the time you get the water you don't want to eat it before you drink the water uh, or yeah you want to eat it before you drink the water so you have to keep the water in the hand and he has to get the plastic with the map as well and it's like you could organize that better <laughs> yeah it it sounds like a process, a whole complicated process there for um, for that to to happen. But anyway, um, not quite done it done it the best when you've got all sorts of things to think about. But um, Casper Fossa there in through, and what a what a gap there! Four minutes thirty five seconds quicker than Joey had on, who we just saw going back to punch control seventeen. But then if he's already registered it. Control 18? I'm a bit confused. Oh, he probably punched 18 before 17, I reckon. Because mm. we got his... He was, like, leading time through control number 18, but I don't think he punched number 17 yet. But here we go. He always... He, look, I think he already knows where this control is. <laughs> so, quick through going, into here. Going for the faster split there. <laughs> oh, well, it's always good if you know where the control is anyway. It's uh, nailed on for a fastest split. So here okay. we can see it. Uh, the, yeah. Now soon we will see it. Uh, Hadon will first approach the 18th control and then go back to the 17th. Uh, Fosser also going there, avoiding the up and down in this uphill. It's a smart move, in my opinion. Good direction still. Now he has to get a bit closer to the line from here he gets this stony area there still a bit far away but uh, very well done there in the end had on kind of the same way there maybe he was seeing Fosser I don't know about the starting interval no that's impossible so then he was just too early, changing direction there, not really looking at the compass, and then fortunately he found control 18, so he could relocate and get back to control 17. And then again, not the best direction there, he should have seen this big stone on the way to 19. That's another mistake there by Joey Hadon. And here the standings. So the standings. Yeah. Yep, standings at split number four, control number 18. That's big lead there for Casper uh, Foster. And Joey Hadon still in that second place despite, um, you know, despite him seeing the 18th control twice and just seeing him make a, a miss to control 19 as well. But a lot of the usual suspects there, a lot of the Czechs doing pretty well, I think. A lot of the Czech team really um, up their game alongside home world championships this year and it's still the, uh, still paying off for them, to be honest. Noah Kamalti, a, a new name, I think making his World Cup debut for France there in the top 30. Here's Matthias Kiberts though, through to the Arena Passage. He was our final starter. He, of course, leads the World Cup standings. But the gap is uh, nearly two and a half minutes now. Still a reasonably comfortable third place for Matthias Kibbert. But if you look the comparison, he just lost that time in the, in the early mm -hmm. stages of the course and then has been really reasonably consistent since then. Yeah, exactly. I mean, he lost two minutes and 18 seconds already to the first TV control. And from then... Uh, it's only nine seconds, he's only nine seconds slower, so it is actually quite a good race here. Um, but he missed in the beginning. So he drinking, but still, I mean, he's... So he maybe not the best organization at <laughs> this uh, <laughs> recreation point. Yeah, and he's but barely looked at the map. But it, <laughs> yeah, yeah, but it looked... <laughs> It just looked uh, a bit funnier at the uh, Gustav Berryman because he had this chill and then he had kind of the map packed on the one arm and the 
the plastic, uh, the the water <laughs> in the in the other hand. It's just it's, yeah. All sorts of chaos going on um, at the <laughs> arena run through, um, but you can you can take that extra water, and they have been taking on a lot of water today. Um, it's a tough, demanding course that you've got to keep hydrated. You've got to keep your body fueled in order to, uh, you know, keep running strong in the final stages. Mm -hmm. and, and when you, as well, you know, th this are this arena run through is at the bottom of the lake. You know there's only one direction you can go uh, from this co this arena passage, and that is up the hill. So uh, you've got to try and try and do as anything you can to help yourself get up there. Mm, I'm sure Michael actually. Bailey was in fourth place, I think, going through the arena passage, and is looking really good, very close to the line here up towards Control 17. Mm, actually, we saw Kasper Foss also going straight to Control 15. I mentioned before that many of the men were going down to the street, and it was it was a good option. He was uh, 11 seconds behind the Control before, and then uh, he was in the lead uh, at the Arena Passage, uh, 28 seconds ahead. So that was a good option to keep up in the slope there. Now we are live with Magne Daly. Yep, so we'll very soon see him at um, the s the third TV split. Sorry, fourth mm -hmm. TV split. I'm losing count. <laughs> it's good direction there. He got the two stones on the way. And now is this small hill heading up to this spur there with a hill on it. Looks very... Very good. Seems to have a, a, a concept up to Control 17. Yeah, there's a few kind of form line re-entrants you can also use to get into there. One with a few kind of boulders in it, a few small stones in there you can really use. Here's Martin Hoopman though. And he's on his way into the finish. So we've still got Isaac von Krusenfreiner is our, still our current leader at the finish and Martin Hoopman not quite matching his uh, great world champs results, sixth place in the long distance. For him, he is going to be outside of the top 10, six minutes down and unsurprisingly a lot closer in the men's race compared to the women's race, but looking strong down through the finish line. So Martin Hoopman goes into equal 15th spot. So a reminder, our top three at the finish, Isaac von Krusenfuena, Alden Heimdall, and then Jon Alkris Osman. So two Norwegians in that top three at the moment. William Lind is in fourth. Simon Imark is in fifth. Pavel Kubat in sixth. Currently, lots, all the big names still to come with uh, Timo Sild. I'm sure we'll see reasonably soon down at mm. the finish. He's been setting some good times. And then, of course, we're looking for Kasper Fosser. And here we have Magna Daly in the picture and that was talking about that he seemed to have control over the situation. But now I think he's off. He's too far to the left here. Uh, if I'm right, then the control is just below the camera here. So he's coming back into the picture here. Maybe, let's see, 40, 50 seconds mistake at that point. Oh yes, wait the next control left until we get the split time, but he for sure lost some time here. Yeah, definitely. It looked like it was going so well, but you've really got to keep the focus and keep the good identification of all the features when it gets into this really detailed spot. There's lots of form line contours here. There's lots of really small detail that you've got to first of all be able to read on the map and then interpret read on the ground as well and match the whole thing up when it's when everything kind of looks the same but there he is into the 18th control well he does Could go really second 
Yeah, you could really see how he slowed down and we started to expect the control. He was just almost stopping, looking around and uh, he expected the control to come a bit earlier, but then it continued a few meters more and could see most probably the advertising there. With Slang Glibov here and um, Magna Daly has overtaken the Ukrainian, so he's kind of dropping down here. But actually looking pretty good through this point to the 18th control. Looking reasonably confident, no hesitations or anything, just checks the punch. And actually goes equal eighth, equal alongside Emil Svensk. So, three left to make it to this point of so our three last starters Daniel Hubman, Gustav Bergman, and Matthias Kibert. This is Gauta Steva. Not his day today. Now, more than 13 minutes down. from Norway into the finish and into 29th position right now for Gjalte. So just inside the top 30, 13 minutes down, and still the leader is Isaac von Krusenfreiner as well. But so let's have a look here. We're looking at Timo Silt. Can he be the first one to go faster than the Swede? Mm -hmm. Pretty good at this from point. Before that he had a bit lower speed, but he got his technique right. Now he missed the control, 21st control here. Good direction to towards control 22. Good also to control 23, but you can see that von Cruz and Juana is just getting closer and closer. Good here to control 24 as well. Looked quite uh, okay there, technically. Gustav Merriman, he was 28 seconds behind. Fosser. And now he has to get to the next control, still together with Daniel Hoopman. He lost time here. That's for sure, he won't be there in 20 seconds. Yeah, he really, you can see how much time he lost between controls 14 and 15, and that was Kasper Fosser going straight um, through to control 15. Everybody else pretty much going down to the road and back up, so that's the difference, about 35 seconds. Um, in, in that there and just dropping a, a few more seconds now here and there compared to the Norwegian. So maybe losing another 20, 30 seconds and between going up this hill from the arena passage to this point here. Mm -hmm. And this was actually a part where Hoopman has to be careful to not lose Beriman because it was quite technical there and the gap was quite big, but let's take Timo Sil to the finish. Yep, let's take Timo Sil to the finish and he is going to be the first one to topple the Swede off the leader's chair. Timo Sil has had a fantastic run today really really technically competent not always the quickest i think we can see on the gps but keeping the mistakes really to a minimum and it is absolutely well rewarded with the new leading time here could well be one of timo sild's best races i think of his career so far that's really good performance there from timo sild the estonian um and yeah two minutes quicker than isaac von krusenfreiner at the finish of course there's still a lot of lot more um runners still to make their way to the finish but to take it at that good leading position out of von krusen who sat in the leader's chair for so long this afternoon really really good work from him mm, very well 
formed here by Timo Sill, then I think this uh, there is a very good chance that he will end up in, let's say, top six, top seven, something like that today, which is a great result from, for the runner from Estonia. Yeah, so confirmation those standings at the finish, Timo Sill just uh, kicking Isaac von Krusenfreund out of the leader's chair. Adam Heimdahl was only 10 seconds behind the Swede, and a lot of the runners there quite close together especially top eight within those four minutes as well. And I think we've seen a lot of kind of the younger runners here uh, really proving their worth uh, as we look at kind of further down into the top 20 there as well. Of course, a lot of a lot of the, the younger runners maybe who've made it as into, a, into senior year in the past couple of years won't have a lot of the world ranking points that we know that, that some of the more experienced runners will have had. They'll have started comparatively early um, in the start list. So I think certainly those completing the top 20, 30 will maybe include some names we are less familiar with, which is always exciting to see some new faces and seeing some new names near the top of the results as well. So looking here, let's have a look at these time for controls from 16 to 18, Casper Fosser. In fact, look at the Norwegians just packing that top three with a really great climb up here. Bergman hasn't done too badly either. Now uh, look at Hadorn again. He will go mm -hmm. to control 18 first, then 17, and then 18 again. And uh, it seemed that he would do a mistake also co to control 19. Maybe we'll see it here. Not really. Stopping here. Oh no. Now we see it anyway. So getting to control 18 here. Going back to 17. Then he has to turn again to control 18. And here I think he he was very much to the north. Here he should see this rock. And but he doesn't just going on getting out to the street then heading towards the wrong direction. This is very unnecessary here. I mean, he's going so much to the north. Ouch. Yeah, get, going out Ouch. to the street here. And then now he has control above. I mean, this is... Um, I'm really surprised he that he didn't see that the the, all the blue, all the streams in the marsh yeah. there and, and not and, and mistake that and then and you're heading north and you're into the kind of actually slightly flatter part. I'm very mm. surprised. I mean, he should, the first thing he's do, he should do when he noticed that he's wrong is like checking the compass and then he should notice that if anything he should, he is going, he was going too much to the north and then head to the south but instead he went even more to the north uh, and not only a bit but very much and uh, that can happen but he did it for a long time he went up the hill there and it would in his position if if he is not sure at all where he is then he has to just take the 50 extra meters and go out to, to the street there but um, don't forget there were 200 meters climbing just before <laughs> it, it maybe uh, I mean, it's hard to do orienteering when you're <laughs> kind of out of oxygen at that point. I mean, yeah, we can talk about all this, but we're <laughs> we're just sitting down and we're, we've got all the benefit of uh, not being <laughs> tired after having run the whole course. It's very, very easy for us to say. Um, but here is uh, yes, Kubert's also not quite in control mm -hmm. here uh, towards the 17th control. And I mean, it's 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 kind of it's a proof that it is very difficult in this mm. part here. I mean, we see almost everyone with problems here, um, and it's just it's it's so hard to get clear features to navigate with. So it's very this makes it so important to use direction as kind of the the baseline of your orienteering, and that's kind of why I. I think Hadorn's mistake was just too big because it showed that mm -hmm. he didn't have the direct direction from the beginning. Otherwise, he would have known that uh, he shouldn't go so much to the north uh, when he is doing a mistake. 
And I think it takes us back to what Emil Svensk was doing. We saw him head too far to the right, but he knew, he saw the cameras mm -hmm. and he knew, right, okay, if, I, if I'm off, I'm off to the right. And he exactly. knew the way to direct. And so even though that was a mistake, he didn't quite lose the time just kind of hunting around for the control mm -hmm. and, and running around in circles because he didn't have complete control, but he wasn't far off. Anyway, Matthias Kibert's just gone through there. And, uh, yeah, dropping down then into fifth spot at that point. And he is about a minute off the medals. Puts Magan Daly into a good position. And Daniel Huben there in fourth. So Timo Sild still our leader at the finish. But he may well end up finishing in the top six if we've got... All of those three can have clean runs and maintain their position. But yeah, Matthias Kubert was very kind of consistently two, two and a half minutes down and then just lost that bit more time into the control there. So tricky, tricky orienteering, even for the best in the world. And uh, that's why this race is so exciting and so challenging. And I think we've got, you know, we've all of those who we've, we've heard from afterwards have have really en enjoyed that orienteering because it's it's quite you know it's very wide it's very open you can see a lot you feel like you're moving quite quickly but also if i think i think they'd complain if it was too easy you've got to be have some technical <laughs> challenging orienteering yeah and i mean you have it's not often you have a race where you can have a leg uh, of about the one uh, or one and a half k where you never cross a path and here it's really mm -hmm. out in the wilderness and you get this rough orienteering you get this very uh, difficult part where it's very detailed and low visibility and then you got these open areas where you just can push hard and really get the feeling that you're you're feeling fast in this kind of sections there uh, it has just everything maybe it's if there if he would say something that's missing with that kind of orienteering this terrain it's you don't have this very uh very let's say decisive route choices of course we mm -hmm. have the one to the second control um but it's not the same as at the world championships where you can lose like two minutes on the route choice <laughs> uh, here it's like straight is always an option yeah, straight is always a good option and we've seen loads of the runners just absolutely bang on the line there. We missed that. There's a little miss from Casper Foster at control number 19. Otherwise, he's seen pretty solid through this last part as well. You can see he's... That was the miss we saw from Timo Sild. So he's way more than three minutes ahead. Here is Milos Nikodim into the finish. Oh, really clutching back his back pain. there. Yeah. Feels that he had struggled a lot uh, during the last years with injuries and problems. Yeah, I think it was in, you know, not too bad shape at the World Championships. I think a bit disappointed. He's got a, he's a very ambitious man, but yeah, certainly today, I think really clutching his back to just to show us that it's it's not been. Uh, plain sailing out in the forest. He's really had a lot of troubles. So a shame there for the Czech runner. They're running with lots of... Uh, <laughs> Lots of timing equipment on their on their wrist today. Again, it's two with a backup, same as they had at the World Championships, just kind of carrying all that extra equipment. Mm, and Casper uh, Foster has been out now for 98 minutes. Uh, the expected winning time is 100 minutes, but we have Timo Sild with 105 minutes and Kasper Fosse was more was around 5 minutes faster before so it's very likely that Kasper Fosse will appear within the next 1 or 2 minutes here 
I think, was that Mika Kimono is just missing the line actually <laughs> into the control there. This is Emil Spence. I thought we should be seeing Emil Spence here soon. Here he is. And was he going to dip under the time of his teammate on Cruz and Fuana? And his fans looking, just gritting his teeth here. He's got to maintain his speed down through and across the line. Is he going to finish in a medal position? He will do that. It's going to cross the line. I think just go ahead. Yes, two seconds ahead of Von Cruz and Fuerna. Straight down on the floor. <laughs> that is a bit of a grimace there, I think, from Emil Spence. Uh, and some, something is something is painful there, I think, yeah, for him. I but guess so he, too. Yeah. He's, he's made it all the way through to the finish. And uh, here we have Florian Hovald as but well. I think we will see Casper Foster soon, mm. maybe. I think there, we will up see. There. So Hovald will go 11th, but we're looking for the Norwegian then, who surely is going to take this new fastest time and almost definitely the win here. Here he is. Here is the long distance world champion. The new kid on the block is going to be Donan again in this long distance. And Casper Fossa, look at that time ahead of Timo Sild. It's going to be more than five minutes here. He crosses the line. Casper Fossa from Norway, one. And he actually goes under the 100 minute mark by only seven seconds. Casper mm -hmm. Fossa, what a display of uh, great running there. The thumbs up. The grin from him, uh, just kind of clutching his hamstring a bit there, but l really, really great performance there. And honestly, I can't see um, yeah, any of the see. others being able to match, really. But on the last 26 minutes of running, he was only 55 seconds faster than Timo Silt. So maybe mm -hmm. we don't really know. Maybe there's a chance anyway. Let's see. The gap was 51 seconds. Of course, it, it was quite a big gap, but... Um, yeah, it can be well, tight we anyway, we, we don't know. We will wait to see. We have D Augusta Bergman chasing hard, I think, around here. And, he'll mm, and have, he'll, he he's got the advantage of knowing the gap as well. Yeah, and Kasper Foster seemed satisfied, so I don't really think that he did a big mistake in the end here. But it's still a very good result here for Isaac von Krusenkwerne. I mean, if we look back, he had some very big mistakes in the beginning and still his fourth position, of course, there are runners out there still. Let's see here now, that's interesting. Yeah. Gustav Berryman compared to Kasper Fosser. We know and Max the standing. Also lined up for a medal as well. Yeah, we know the standing at control 18. But after that, we haven't seen a lot of uh, Gustav Berryman at least. The gap there, the 18th control, was 51 seconds. So he was uh, very fast here. We know that he had the fastest time. Kasper Foster up to the 17th control. So. Yeah, Kasper small Foster mistake there. there. Yeah. yeah. Small mistake. So now it's very tight <laughs> here. <laughs> he has a bit. It's a bit faster ah. there in speed. Gustav Gusta Bergman a bit more straight. Bit straight. Ah, ah, but getting no, now off he's direction. Yeah. Yeah. Getting off direction there. He was kind of lucky to get the stream there. But now the gap is around a minute again, if not more. So this looks very, very good for Kasper Foster. Yeah, it looks very good. We're live then with Gustav Bergman. So he's on his way from 22 to 23. Not much orienteering left. And look, so if you can look at those controls, 18 to 25. Kasper Foster was the quickest through there. Gustav, oh, Gustav, no, so it's from controls 18 to 25. So we don't have Gustav Bergman's time there. That's why we can't really tell. But you can see Foster and Heindahl had really good ends. And they were 45 seconds mm -hmm. quicker on those. That leap compared... So to everybody else. So Gustav Berryman would need to be one minute faster than the fastest one in this section of the race. <laughs> I don't think that will happen. No. No, he almost looked like he had the speed, but then coming round that 
there to control 21. It wasn't quite it wasn't quite there. That's a very tricky control as you were talking about mm. earlier. And and you can see it here on the map. It's actually one of the of very few parts of the map where you have s a few green areas and this is kind of an indication that okay here it has to be more dense than in other parts. Also the course planner told us when you have this ponds and kind of uh, all the features related to water then often the terrain is a bit more dense as well so this is kind of a tricky area around control 21 there and uh, Berryman just got off direction a little bit well, lots of uh, Swedish orienteers waiting here to see whether Gustav Bergman is going to able to catch up the time from Kasper Foss. It's looking more and more unlikely. He's going to have to have an absolute blind to be able to take that, but is still looking good for a silver medal here too. Ooh, and this is, if we're live with all of them, looks like Daniel Hoodman has actually got away from Gustav Bowman in the end, and that's mm. really interesting. They've taken different routes at some point there, and that is, yeah, that's pretty pretty interesting. To That just shows that, that Gustav Bowman has kind of made mistakes, dropped back, because Hoodman's managed to get ahead again. Mm. It's true, and we also see that Magnadelli is together with so we had on, or let's say, put it that way, so we had on is together with Magna <laughs> Valley. Mm, this is interesting, another mistake. Oh, that's, that's another mistake. So let's see how much time it will take. So what could be the problem there? Why should he go so far? Maybe he thought that the hill he passed there to the left is the one more uh, a bit earlier to the left, the bigger hill there. Just passed, but this mm. is very strange. He must have lost kind of the feeling of the distance. Now he sees this small pond there. I think he feels like he must be going up the re-entrant, and that's the one yeah, exactly. he wants to go up in the controls at the top of it, but he's, he has realized now. He thought that he was like 30, mm. 30 meters more to the left than he was, and then getting up to this re-entrant. But then uh, it kind of saved him that he saw this small pond there. But that was, let's say, yeah, it's quite a big mistake here if you compare to Hoopman. The gap is now mm. two minutes, it was maybe 40 seconds before. And now you've got to think he was in quite a solid silver medal position and now you've got to think what is his time going to be compared to Magna Daly who is at control number 25. We're soon going to see him at the finish, probably slotting mm -hmm. into second space, but where will and Gustav Bergman figure in that? Magna Daly was 3.14 behind at TV4, so at control 18, but then at the pre-warning where we punched just now, he has only 1.45 behind. So he's getting closer. We know for sure that Casper uh, Foster did a mistake up there at control 19, if I remember right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So that's the reason, but uh, it shows that Daly did a good race here in the end. So there is definitely a chance for him to pass Gustav Berryman. Yeah, I think you're right. I think there's definitely the potential. I think Gustav Berman is now racing for the bronze medal, is my guess. And Magna Daly is racing for silver because he has caught time on his Norwegian teammate, Kasper Foster. And Magna Daly, the bronze medalist from the World Champs Long, is going to go into a really good second place here. He's really got to push these final meters because he knows there's some good runners still to go and he won't know how well they're doing. He's just got to fight here keeping his balance and keep pushing through all the way through to the line here so like the daily goes into second place then one minute 39 behind his teammate behind Casper Fosser who I'm pretty sure we can safely say has mm. won this one but it's where will let uh, Gustav Bergman come and uh, yeah what's gonna happen I'm for the medals I'm kind of happy for him as well. It was a tough situation at the long distance world championship when he was kind of uh, following uh, in the group. But I mean, he didn't really have a choice. What should you do if you're in the group with the, with the strongest runner? You don't want to take uh, 
I mean, you're still an athlete and you want to, to perform as good as possible. In that situation, it was all about keeping together in the same train. But now here in this race, he could really kind of take revenge and prove that he is one of the world's best uh, long distance runners. And I think that's very, very good for him uh, that he could prove that today. OK, so these two athletes are synced up here on our GPS tracking. So it's as if they started at the same time. Gustav Bergman was in the lead into 23, but this is where things mm -hmm. start to go a little bit wrong for the Swede. And does Daly nip ahead? I think he will do. Yeah, and this was very close there. He was very close to the control. Ny ledare mål, Kasper Foster, förmodligen också vinnare. Hur har du haft idag här uppe på Burusjön, Idefjäll? Nej, det har varit uh, kul, men tufft, <laughs> absolut. Det har varit, uh, ja, varit en uh, kamp från start, så uh, jag är uh, jättenöjd med loppet. Uh, jag tyckte jag hade en, uh, hade en stabilt lopp utom uh, en kontroll, där jag missade en par minuter. Uh, så var det jättebra, så jag, jag är uh, jättenöjd. Vilken av de största utfordringen, var var den största utmaningen med den här banan? Uh, jag tror det, det svåraste för mig är liksom att läsa kartan när det blir stenigt i backen. Så jag, ja, det gäller liksom att klara läsa kartan även om, även om man också måste passa på vart man sätter benen. Så det är, ja, det är en svår grej och det är något annat än det man har tränat för in mot Tjeckien. Så det är en ny utmaning som jag ja, tyckte var svårt idag. Och tydligt är också att du hanterar favoritskap, för nu mer är du favorit när du ställer upp Kasper. Det hanterar du väldigt, väldigt bra. Är du nöjd med det också? Ja, absolut. absolut. Jag, ja, vad, som, vad, vad andra tycker jag kan klara, det, det bryr mig inte så mycket om. Det är mer vilket press jag lägger på mig själv som är viktigt. Och det, ja, jag har alltid haft stora förväntningar till mig själv, så det, det är det som gäller. Stort grattis. Tack så mycket. So he he said that it was very nice, but a really tough race for him. Um, he had to fight from the start, and he's very satisfied with his run, except for one control, the one we have seen there, up 19, where he missed quite a bit. Uh, the most difficult part in this race for him was definitely to read the map in stony areas, because it was kind of, you had to have... Uh, to keep the different balls in the air by just the balancing through the stony and rocky terrain and also focus on the difficult uh, yeah challenges that this course uh, yeah was was given to the runners and it was he said it was quite different compared to the race uh, the long distance in the Czech Republic of course because it was totally different kind of uh, orienteering here and then last question was about the fact that he now had to handle the pressure to be the favorite mm. and then he answered that uh, he doesn't really care about what others think uh, that he always had uh, high expectations of himself and that it's for him the pressure is coming from himself and not really from outside so it he didn't really care or he doesn't really care about this pressure from outside yeah well having chatted to him on the podcast that i do that's that's exactly how he, he came across to me there really really driven really focused and really ambitious as well but daniel hubman is he about to get a bronze medal here because he was looking neck and neck with gustav bergman here he's gonna definitely go into bronze medal position here and will he have saved it i we couldn't see exactly where he broke away from the swede um, but he may well just have run himself into a bronze medal. So he finishes in third place, three minutes, 20 behind. You can see his eyes are straight looking on that results board. He goes, he shows the top three women and the top three men, and he has just nipped onto there. But we did just see in that kind of GPS tracking when we were talking about um, Kasper Fosser, we saw that him and Gustav Bergman were absolutely neck and neck in the way to control number 24. So... Will this mistake from Gustav Bergman at number 23, will that have completely cost him a medal? We will wait and see. It'll be a couple of minutes, in fact, three minutes, I think, before we see him into the finish. But these are our standings so far. Kasper Fosser, 
we can say he's won that. I think we've Magna Daly is fine for his silver medal now. And Daniel Hoodman currently in bronze medal position. Timo still there, just edged out of the medals at the moment. Then a bit of a bigger gap back to Emil Svensk in to fifth. Let's have a look here. Um, we're looking at the at uh, Matthias Kubert's uh, yeah. tracking as well because he's going to lose some big amounts of time. He was quite, kind of quite consistently between two and two and a half minutes down and then something has happened up on this slope and we saw him at the mm. top having a bit of trouble. Yeah, we saw him in the picture when we had the camera at control 17 where he came too much to the left there. Losing time still here. It looks okay uh, going to this hill there. And then just going a bit too much to the left. Not a big mistake at that point. Emil Svensk, how are you happy with your Ja, resultatmässigt så är jag väldigt nöjd. Det var, jag var bia 6 och 7 någonstans tror jag. Det, det får jag väldigt nöjd med, med tanke på hur det, hur det kändes och hur jag orienterade och sådär. Så ja. Vad menar du? Hur kändes det dåligt eller vad då? Ja, det var lite misstag där i början. Så att, ja, jag var nog slutligen var helt borta på känns om. Och jag var lite tur att jag hittade kontrollen till slut där. Men sen tycker jag kom in i det bra igen. Och sen ja, ner mot varvning och dryga halva banan och började känna kramp i båda baksidorna håll i magen här. Så det var jobbigt och långt sista varv. Hur, hur förväntat var det här? Liksom, du är ändå hyggligt van vid terräng uppe på Idefjäll. Ja, precis. Ja, vi är hemma i hemma, hemma länet här så att jag borde vara van med stenar i marken. Men det var, nej, det var jobbigt till och med för mig att det var så mycket stenar i marken tycker jag. Vilken var den största utmaningen tycker du? Ja, det var att hålla koll på kartan och gå och springa samtidigt. Det är, ju, ja, det är väldigt svårt tycker jag. Medelstans på lördag, nya tag. Ja, precis. Det är kortare bana så det är jag nöjd med. Här. Så att, ja. Tack. Tack. So he he's very satisfied with uh, the result, but not with the race uh, itself. He said that he physically uh, wasn't really there, and he had some really bad technical parts where he was totally lost. He said, and in the end, he got even cramps. Uh, he was even if he is from the area here, was kind of. Uh, surprised about how stony it was so it was uh, quite a fight for him anyway and uh, the biggest challenge was uh, also he says that to keep them keep going with the map reading in this kind of terrain and then uh, he was asked uh, about the middle distance and he said yeah at least it's shorter so it's good <laughs> for me <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're looking now for Gustav Bergman into the finish. There he is behind now, but I think he will just be out of the medals. He is going to be just out of the medals. We can see there. I don't know what happened, but he was running to control number 24, and he was just so much slower than Daniel Hoodman. They, they, neither of them seemed to make a mistake, but the uh, Swiss was just catching him up, and he looked really not under control on his mm. way down this slope and he just crosses the line I think either there's an injury in there or whether there's he just has slowed down in the latter part of this course kind of after the stony bit but especially really noticeable there into number 24 we'll try and like pick that out for you again because he lost, you know, he lost over three minutes. The Daniel Hoodman, Daniel Hoodman were running together, and now Daniel Hoodman has managed to get away from him and get three minutes as well. So that is pretty big surprise here for Daniel for Gustav Berman. We know he was, uh, he he quit the um, the World Champs long distance final. He had, I think, a, it's a kind of back injury, but it doesn't all quite look very smooth uh, down here. Doesn't he has often problems with his back? Uh, it doesn't move too smoothly here. Maybe you can listen and hear what he's saying. If he's saying anything. One hour, forty-four minutes and four seconds. Really. Not really. Uh. Then so, försöker liksom springa men då det går inte. Ah, exakt. Men det var ju för att jag försökte bara på Daniel. Vad jag måste kämpa. Och så bara ah. Men. Said. He said that he tried to follow Hoopman, but it just didn't go. And then he had uh, the mistake was because he tried to follow him, but he, it just wasn't possible. I don't know if it was due to pain or due to the fact that he was tired. Uh, he just said and that it was impossible. Yeah, there can also be a part of the... F even if he's not injured currently, we know he was um, injured after the World Champs and whether that just puts you back in terms of training and means you're not quite feeling 
as good towards the end of a long distance race. You're feeling fine at the beginning. You look very good towards the beginning, but it just, when it really takes its toll is at the back end of a race. And I think uh, that might be kind of what we've seen from from Gustav Bowman today. So uh, he was outside of the medals as you see Wojtek crawl in through to the finish. Not a great race for him today, but um, our top three though, Kasper Fosser, Magna Daly and Daniel Hubman. And uh, aside from, we've still got Matthias Kubert to come into the finish as well. He is, uh, I think, too far uh, down. I don't know. He could yeah, still no. be in the fight for the fourth position. Yeah, I think he could still be in the fight for the fourth place. He has to, but he has to he has come to very hard. soon. Yeah. Yeah. Come so now. our top three here today, Casper Foss and Magna Daly, Daniel Hubman, we're all in the top four at the World Championships long distance race. And we've really got some consistency there from these three guys. And we'll see where Matthias Kibertz is able to end. Because if it's those top four in the same top four spots here, just a slightly different order. I mean, maybe that will make some of those who commented about the trains maybe kind of think <laughs> again, maybe. I don't know. That was a very special situation. And I'm, I'm actually quite glad we didn't see the trains here and, and we even saw people grouping together and then um, kind of grouping apart again, you know, like mm. the way that Daniel it's Hubman was able to run away from Gustav Bergman. Yeah, of course, it's what I mentioned before. It's harder to keep together, together in the group here uh, when it's this kind of terrain because uh, when you look back at the terrain in Czech Republic, you had very difficult route choices but once you have decided the route choice it's more or less running on on paths and very distinct uh, ways to the control so it's it's hard to lose a runner there but here it's so you have so many options i mean the the main direction often is straight but on this you have many different micro route choices and if you get into a, a dense area uh, and you'd lose the runner in front of you out of sight and then come out of the dance area again and you don't exactly know where you are, then you're lost. So you have to keep control of the map at all the time. That's exactly what we've seen uh, with Gustav Berryman when he most probably tried to keep together with Hoopman and then he didn't see him anymore and just mm. passed the control of few meters and didn't have full control over the situations and this is much more it's much more difficult to keep together in this kind of the ter terrain if you are the runner that is a bit slightly slower than the other one yeah well we will see and Gustav Berg normally puts something up on his social media um, mm -hmm. after the race so I'm sure he will give something of a debrief to um, to, to his, his followers on social media so watch out for that one and we're just waiting for Matthias Kubert here in to the finish but you can see something has gone wrong again for Matthias Kubert he's down seven minutes down there at control number 25 which is the pre-warning control the one he's just punched we'll see him kind of there we go we can see him in in the distance there winding his way through the trees and lots of cheering going on from the fact that we do actually have some spectators here in this arena but Matthias Kibbert's the last start of the World Cup leader it's going to be uh, maybe only just sneaking into the top six here Timo Sild, great result then for him in fifth place Matthias Kibbert, maybe he was on for kind of a third or fourth place at, at points but just not quite making it for him today and he also looks pretty broken on the wrist this descent down um, into the finish it's been tough and gruelling race then and Kibbert will finish in sixth place then seven minutes and nine seconds behind Casper Fosser and I yeah. think a lot of the uh, athletes will be glad of a rest day tomorrow to try and recover from that long distance. We've seen a lot of grimaces and pained faces there um, today. So with Matthias Kubert in, we can look at those results then um, before they are made official. So Casper Foster taking that win a minute and uh, 
39, cementing his place as the maybe he's the new king of the long distance. Of course, no Olaf Lindenes here today. He is pretty injured. Magna Daly backing his uh, world champs long bronze medal up with a second place here today. Daniel Huben then also going one better than he did in the Czech Republic with the top three. Any other names you want to pick out? Um, uh, well, for sure, Timo Sil did a great run here. He was mostly, I mean, we have seen other runners having company out there. Tim Sealed was quite often uh, running by himself and he did a great performance uh, 5 minutes and 50 behind and on 5th position but also um, two Norwegians, Audun Heimdall Juno Krust, Usmoen 9 and 10, Isaac von Krusenstjerna the sprint world champion on 8th position and uh, one more runner to highlight uh, again, Otim Sien uh, did a good race here even though he had some company, but still, um, yeah, 11th position, yeah. that's good. Now I'm unsure, was he together with, uh, run together with Timo Sild anyway? So maybe they were, let's see, yeah, so those, I, I was wrong before, they were together, but still that was a, a successful group there on 5th and 11th position. And here we have the GPS of the top Four. Uh, everyone, all of them straight to the second control. No one uh, of the top four has chosen to go down. Rounding this hill there. Quite a gap here. We had it uh, in earlier races that Casper Foster uh, just pushing away and then a big mistake there by Magne Daly to the fourth control. Tracking from the best also the here a mistake the by Fosser and by Hopman. It's really kind of the thing of this race. No one ki managed to get through without any mistakes and it's exactly, I mean, that's why everyone is so tired. It's such an intense race. Um, usually you get at one point the route choice where in a long distance where you can just kind of relax and use a path and run one or two k's around uh, and get kind of a free distance where you don't have to fight too much but in this race here you had to fight through the rocky and stony terrain um, all the way f and at the same time it was very demanding technically so yeah it, it makes it hard to get through without any mistakes and that's what we see here no one really managed to do so also all of the top four went straight from 14 to 15 we know that uh, this was a good option then getting down to the arena passage map change here and uh, here in this, especially in this part, Kasper Fosse was very strong up to the 17th control. Uh, also notice that Daly and Hoopman, the gap, gap here wasn't too big at that point. Hoopman still um, together with Gustav Bergman at that point. And here we have a mistake by Kasper Fosse, the one he was talking about. Mistake from Magna Daly as well, actually, there. 17, yeah. as we saw. So, Foster, he actually had two mistakes in the race. One early in the race and one at Control 19 here. And now, soon, we will see that Gustav Bergman will have more and more problems. To keep together with Hoopman. Now we, of course, have a Hoopman behind here, because it's not a live replay. But here this the mistake. mistake, decisive mistake there, missing the control. And at that point, Hoopman's just much faster than Bergman. Maybe notice that he now has a chance to actually regain that third position. And we also saw that uh, there was another small mistake at 24 by Kasper Fosser. Yeah, I'm interested to hear what, what went wrong on 24 because Gustav Bergman was a really solid bronze medal position mm -hmm. and just and Daniel Hoopman just maybe paced it better um, you know his his real class coming through towards the end of this long distance race he did a really good job to be able to to pull back into that bronze medal position and I think really really well deserved as well and and I think yeah so I mean ultimately we've seen a lot of the the 
the names you would expect at, at the top of the medals, but there have been a few some few surprises. Timo Sildjian there, and certainly with some of the young Swedish uh, youngsters in terms of um, Hanna Lindbe and from Isaac von Krusenfuena, and I think their consistency will improve as they race more and more and more at this level. And I think once that manages to kind of creep up, then they will certainly be mm. vying for medals. I think they had the speed there. They just made too many mistakes for this level of competition when yeah. not everybody had a perfect result, but some people only made like one or two very, very small mistakes. And they just, I think, need to get that consistency up. But someone who is, is very consistent is Simona Abersold, and she was really, really were rewarded well today. And so too, Kasper Fosser, a few tiny mistakes, but ultimately really, really consistent and now adding that second long distance win um, this year, that really um, kind of has shown that, that those who are consistent in their orienteering, no matter what the style of terrain is and are able to adapt to those different terrains really quickly have have shown okay. that they, they've really succeeded here today. Mm. And I mean, we were talking about consistency and uh, young Swedish runners, but <laughs> we're really talking about like complaining on a high level here. Isaac von Klusenkwen, he, he did mistakes today, ended up on the eighth position. He did mistake at the European Championships in sprint, but it was very close to top three or five position already there. So there's so much potential in this Swedish team. Um, I this think that's I'm also saying. the reason. Yeah, I think that, these, that's these also the reason why Abersol told us that uh, she was so surprised that she could actually beat uh, Alexanderson in her home terrain. Yeah, it's very impressive, and Alexanderson saw make well. We don't know. We didn't see her make mistakes because we didn't have a GPS tracking. I'm sure <laughs> there'll be some sort of uh, analysis afterwards. So Tova Alexanderson, um, for once, uh, not on top of the podium, and she will go home with the bronze today. Uh, second place, really great result then from Andrina Benjaminson. Looked really kind of again solid and consistent today, and she will get upgrade her result from the World Championships and end up with a silver medal. But taking her first individual World Cup win, it feels like she must have had one already, but it, now is the time for Simona Abersold with really consistent race. And you saw how she ple how pleased she was. I'm sure she, along with many of the other women, have, have spent the whole time during and after the World Champs going, how do we beat Tova Alexanderson, she, who has been so dominant over the past few years, but especially at this World Championships, and she has done it today and is rewarded with being right at the top of that podium then. So Simona Abersol just having the consistency and taking the win, but the three different nations there represented on top of the podium. Congratulations to all three of them. They will have a well-deserved rest tomorrow before going again in the middle distance on Saturday and then the relay on Sunday as well. They'll get their flowers. Medals will be awarded a little bit later once all the results have made official, everything like that. But I hope we're going to move straight on to the men's flower ceremony as well. I can see them all just there in the background getting ready to go. And there are a few spectators out here to uh, wish them well and to celebrate their success. And we can, they're just getting, getting organized to uh, award the flowers then to these top three. And they can make their way onto the podium. So the three best men together with Amelia and Susan. So the top three. They don't really know what they're doing. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, I just wanted to mention it's kind of different approaches here. Yeah. Hey, and just yeah, climbing on the podium from the front. Why well, not? Anyway, Daniel Hope in there. They're so experienced on the podium, but still, it uh, <laughs> seems that yeah, it's, it's uh, different times at the moment.
It is different times at the moment. And, uh, and then you actually appreciate that these flower ceremonies need to be directed quite strongly because they've just finished the race. They probably don't know their left and their right at the moment and how to, what to do on a podium, but they managed to be up there. So a silver medal then for Magna Daly from Norway and taking the title once again, really cementing his place at the top of the long distance. It is Casper Foster. What can he do for the rest of the weekends? But two Norwegians and uh, one Swiss there. No Swedish medals after such a Swedish dominance at the World Championships. We have now got no Swedes on the men's podium here at this World Cup round or this World Cup round in Sweden. But those three will certainly celebrate theirs. Do you have a performance of the day doing us here? Um, well, I mean, we have a first-time World Cup winner. I think we, I would like to pick that as the performance of the day. Uh, Simona Abersolt, uh, as you mentioned, it really felt that she must have had many victories before. Uh, from the first appearance of her at the European Champs 2018, I guess, it, it was, you get really the feeling it's just a matter of time until she would win one. And now, uh, three years later, she's got her first World Cup victory, which is very well deserved uh, if you think about the consistency she had during the last yeah, competitions and years even. Yeah, she's been so close so many times before, but she's made it there. We will be back this weekend with the middle distance and then the relay. We'll see you on Saturday. See you.